Hi, this is Bobby Ryan of the Detroit Red Wings, and you are listening to Empty Betters with Nick, Mack, and Harrison. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to episode 71 of Empty Betters. I'm your host, Harrison Scholes, and I'm going to toss it across the screen to my co-host, Nick Manella. How are we doing, buddy? And breathe. We made it through deadline day, boys. It's always just, I mean, I feel like this day, I'm just like glued to my phone nonstop, whether it's calls, text, you know people want to know what's going on or you're getting like, you know, I'm sure you guys are the same way. I have bleacher report coming at me. I have the score. I have NHL.com. It's just the phone doesn't stop on, you know, a day like today. And yeah, uh, somehow survived it, but yeah, can't complain. Imagine being an insider on one of these days. I don't think you sleep. I don't think you breathe. I don't think you eat. I think it's literally just phone Adderall water piss, Addy piss and repeat yeah. cycle every time. Uh, and I'm going to toss it across the screen to my other co-host, Mac Vogel. How are we doing, man? I'm doing well. Yeah, like Nick said, just kind of calm after the storm. It was a uh, little slow for a while. And then kind of like Barry Trotz said it was going to be, it just blew up all at, all at once with a lot of deals coming in after after the uh, noon deadline or three o'clock for you Eastern folks. But um, yeah, I mean, Harry, you said it. I can't imagine being an insider. Um my dad who obviously is just covering it for one team is up to a million every year with the trade deadline. So, I mean, imagine being somebody that's literally just in charge of covering it for the whole league. I mean, that's a whole lot. That's a whole lot, man. It's a lot. I do have to say, and we were talking about this earlier, I turned on NHL network at 9 AM East coast time this morning. And by nine Oh two, I had switched to the TSN feed. Yep. <laughs> it I, I made it through two minutes of they you suck. Know, Brian so, Lawton. And I like Brian Lawton, but yeah. he was like just talking about the most asinine hypothetical stuff that was never going to happen. I'm like, can we talk about who's actually going to get moved today? It's, it was just bad. It's interesting to me. I haven't watched the network in a while because I don't have access to it. But in high school, when I had my mom's cable, I was watching it all the time. But like, what did they just not really do their homework or what? Like, what would it, you say? Was it, it's just not even that. It's yeah, just they a, just weren't talking about it. It was the, the layout of TSN also like Nick, when you sent the Snapchat, they have like nine analysts going on at once. Mm -hmm. It's really, it, it's high energy. It's kind of funny. They try to make it fun. Yeah. Whereas NHL network is just like spit the facts, might yeah. grow up, might hit you with one or two one-liners where you giggle. But they're bad jokes, yeah. Yeah. I just think the way the show flows, it's, you know, even like later in the day when EJ Raddick comes on and they're recapping it's trades, it's just, it's not, no. like it, it almost puts you to sleep and it seems like they're almost like 10 minutes behind everyone else. I did used to love falling asleep to NHL Network now <laughs> that I remember, so. <laughs> well, yeah, I, ever since our boy Steve Mearsy left, I feel like it hasn't been the same. But yeah. uh, I did I, find it funny, like, Harry, you were talking about, like, the nine guys in, like, the square. They called it, like, the Trady Bunch, like, the Brady Bunch, which, you know, <laughs> the most cringeworthy Canadian humor possible, but it, it's still entertaining. Oh, yeah, and I texted, I texted you guys this on, um, I think, Saturday night, but – just watching the ESPN feed for the uh, the UMass National Championship game. I Was it Butchie Gross? And Melrose. Electric. So good. I thought the game was very exciting. I love Butchie Gross's calls. I think that, you know. He was the play-by-play -play guy? Yeah. Yeah. yeah he did he really great. well. He, he, he brings some fucking energy to the platform. So I like it. Yeah. Uh, if. If we don't land Gary Thorne, I would be happy with Butchie Gross, honestly. I think he's better than Forslund, Kenny Albert, all those guys. Well, it's that same kind of – you said I, exactly what you texted us while I was going on. It, it reminds me of the the Gary Thorne era where he has just that, like, extra energy. It's like almost like the kind of, like, video game, like, fire wagon hockey where it's yeah. like, oh, yeah, big you need save. That. Like, the way he, like, 
is yeah. so animated about it. I mean, the one call I texted you guys, but when the goalie for UMass made like four stops in a row and literally he just goes, save Lindbergh, save Lindbergh, three for a dollar, four for a dollar, 25. <laughs> you need that. Like just, I love that. Like yeah. great like, energy. When guys like, you know, are in scruff, scuffles or whatever, like on NBC, will be like, and now there's a pile up in front of the net and Butch Cross is like, and they're firing in front. I'm like, that's yeah. what you need. You right. need that. Anyways, enough of our uh, yeah, television yeah, yeah. opinions. We'll wait until we're on TV one day. Lots to discuss. God help if we're ever on TV one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll be standing here like they cut to us. We're like, oh, oh, oh yeah. sorry. I've, so, I've got like two wings hanging out of my mouth. Yeah, like, exactly. You know. Mac, I'm so jealous you got a Mickey right now. I didn't have any in the fridge. I'm drinking. Oh, yeah. It's I'm like golf wheat. season. I feel like Mickey's a golf beer. Oh, yeah. I'm drinking I call this wheat water, Miller mm-hmm. Lite, for all those who are not watching on YouTube, if you're not, oh, you yeah. should be. Um, so big episode today. Trade deadline just happened, ended about four hours ago. So we are going to roll through our analysis for the big trades and catch you up to date on the smaller trades. <clears throat> I think there's a couple things worth noting before we get rolling here. Uh, one, the new merch store is now live uh, Nick Mack and I have been working with Clay at Play It Again Sports in Westminster, who also works for Wilson Printing Company, I believe is the name. Wilson's Print Shop. Wilson's Print Shop. Uh, they do merchandise. They do jersey sales. They do all sorts of stuff that can help your intramural college, high school team. If you have a brand where you want to start putting merch out with your logo on it, make sure to give Clay a call at Wilson's Print Shop or Play It Again Sports Westminster. I know Wilson's print shop is working on some social media platforms at the moment. It's not up and running yet, but they're going to get there. And when they do, we'll make sure that we uh, post about them so you guys can see. So we got new merch. uh, You know, looks great. Looks great. Materials better. New designs. Got some Under Armour stuff up there. We got backpacks. We got locker room tees. We got golf polos. Uh, You know, Mac just said it's golf season and it sure is. So go check it all out. Backpacks are sweet too. They are. They are sweet. So, we appreciate Clay's help. And, you know, if you guys are willing to purchase some merch, obviously it helps us out, helps us to do cooler shit, basically. Uh, and we also have an interview guest. I'm going to let Nick take this one. Yeah. So we were lucky enough to be joined by Jim Toft. Jim is a former minor league uh, and college hockey official who worked as a linesman in the ECHL, AHL, and he was a referee in d1 men's and women's college hockey in the ecac conference so ton of great stories from jim i'm sure as a linesman not only in the literally in the minors you know living out slap shot but like you know the college hockey as well up in the ecac is so competitive so it was such a a great experience for us to be able to talk to him and what a unique path to of um of you know his history in hockey we love getting getting guys on the show that have been through all kinds of different hockey paths and i think this is definitely another unique one yeah first, definitely first referee i think right i think I so i think so yeah unless somebody else maybe was a ref here and there but i mean first like right. full-on ref yeah yeah um all right let's get to it we got a lot to cover sit back relax uh and we're gonna get rolling nick i'm gonna toss it off to you yeah so we have a ton of stuff to get to we have some nhl history being made we have all the trades to get to we have some signings and some waiver claims to get to but we're going to start today with some college hockey so the umass minutemen beat st cloud state five zip to win uh the ncaa men's hockey title they knocked off the two-time defending champs minnesota duluth to capture their first champion on the way to capture their first championship Uh, And it was nice for them because they got some revenge because Duluth was actually the team that knocked them out two years ago, the last time this tournament was played. Uh, That was when UMass had uh, one guy named Kale McCarr. I think he's doing okay now. Uh, So awesome to see that, you know, always exciting when a non-traditional hockey power gets to, you know, beat up on some of the big boys. It's what makes that tournament so great. So I had a ton of fun watching those games. I know you guys did too, and we were able to make some money off of them as well, which is always Nice for us. Jack Campbell. I think this guy's pretty damn good. He made NHL history with his 11th straight victory to start the season. Unreal. It's soup time. It really is soup time. He made 27 saves to set the NHL record for consecutive consecutive victories to start the season. And the Leafs beat the Senator six to five on Saturday night. He's the only goalie ever to start a season 11 and 0. Hell yeah. Way to go, buddy. 
absolutely wild. He's had a pretty uh, unique journey too. He was a highly, um, all right, don't make fun of me, highly touted. Yep, good job. Let's go. Don't know how to spell it, but we're not going there. Um, <laughs> highly touted American prospect, I believe, when he was coming up through the ranks. Call me, I think he was on the same world junior team as Domingo and Cristo. He might have been, I think he was. Uh, I hope I'm not butchering that. But he was like similar to Fucali, a very big name coming into the draft. He's kind of had some bumps in the road. I know he was in Dallas, I believe, for a little bit, and there was some promise there, but it, things kind of fell you know, apart. And he had an interview after I think it was either his ninth or tenth win. I don't know if you guys got to see it, but he got pretty yeah. emotion. He got pretty emotional, and it was pretty, you know, cool to see a guy who showed like that he had been through some shit, and he knew that he was capable of doing what he's doing now. It's just he found the right place. He feels comfortable. He's got good teammates. I mean, the, the Leafs seem to freaking love him. And he's twenty nine. Yeah. Just yeah. FYI, just tossing that out there. Like nobody yeah. really, really has realized that so 10 years ago 10 or 11 years ago yeah that would make sense nick for the yeah. world junior team um but good for him i mean it's hard not to root for a guy like that so the leafs is, like i think i said it two weeks ago there is a goaltending controversy at this moment 100 percent. yeah yeah I, well it might not even be a controversy now i mean you gotta ride soup until this the wheels fall off i would think so and well we'll talk about what they made, what deal they made goaltending yeah. wise in a little bit as well. But that, that also plays into everything. Yeah, for sure. Uh, some more juice for the Leafs. Austin Matthews is <laughs> just having a career year. He's got 31 goals in 38 games uh, in the salary cap era. Only guys named Ovechkin, Crosby, Stamkos, and Kovalchuk have hit that mark by game 41 of a season. Matthews became just the fifth to do it. And it's only the seventh time it's happened in the past 20 years. He's on pace for 43 goals in 53 games. And that would be top three all time goals per game average for a single season. Not bad in a shortened year after a pandemic. So, <laughs> uh, he's on pace to be the Leafs all time leading goal scorer by age 27. And he has yet to play a full 82 game season for the club. Which I, I, keep, I keep forgetting that he like always gets hurt and misses like 10 games a year. I think I'm not sure if it's 82 games. I think you're right on that. I think this um, stat that I tried to pull there was he hasn't even played four complete seasons, like regardless right. of injuries. It's kind of like three and a half seasons, I guess, at this okay. point. Um, he's only played in 320 career games. So, yeah, for whatever that's worth. And another fun stat. Uh, 50% of Mourner's 38 assists so far this year. Half of those 38 are all on Matthews goals. It seems like it's always Matthews from Marner when I'm looking through the score sheets at the end of the night on, on the NHL app and whatnot. It's always those two connecting. Great chemistry. What do the prop bets look like for those guys to get like two points in a night? Is that just like minus 250 to start it off? No, oh, see, well, I wish I wish I'd... we had the ability to parlay those though. I know, know. I, know I know some books do, but... I nailed that two point prop for Matthews against the senators the other night. It was only like minus one thirty five, I think. Okay. For two points though. I mean, they were playing the senators. We'll get into that in our gambling trends, but yeah, Matthews forget a career year. He's having a historic year. This is just yeah. absolutely absurd what he's able to do right now. Yeah. Um, the le Forget the Bieber curse. That's way gone. <laughs> uh, remember that when I remember when I was starting that, I yeah, think that's funny. going. Yeah. yeah. I, I think uh, I think they're on the right track. So all is good. Uh, yeah, all is good, especially for us here outside the nation's capital, because the Washington Capitals have announced that they are going to allow fans at home games at 10 percent of their capacity. The Caps will first welcome back fans for their game against the New York Islanders on April 27th. I'm already looking at tickets. Yes, you don't have to ask. Uh, so that's great. I mean, it's been a while. It's been. Almost. I thought they were supposed to have fans tomorrow against Philly. No, really, the one no. I read said um, I think, I the twenty seventers. Huh. Okay. Interesting. Maybe it was just that that was like the official date that it got approved, or something I know like the that, Wizards but... are going to have fans like a week before the Caps do. I think just because of the way the schedule works, or something like that. Interesting. 
Okay. Uh, well, either way, it's great news. It is. It's been so long since I've been to that building, and I can't wait to get back there. Uh, some other Caps news. We mentioned this last week that Henrik Lundqvist had said that you know it's not he's not ruling out anything about returning to the club this year. But after following a uh, following up a doctor appointment, uh, he put out a statement saying last week's checkup showed some inflammation around the heart that now requires a few months of rest and steady recovery. While it's not what I hope for, I know this is all part of the process of getting back to 100%. So just want to wish Hank the best and speedy recovery and you know hope he's feeling well and his family's doing well, but he will not be returning for the Caps this season. Uh, the start date for the Stanley Cup playoffs is now sort of up in the air following this whole Vancouver Canucks uh, everyone has COVID uh, issue. So it was extended. The end date for the regular season has now been extended to May 16th. Uh, that was released this past weekend. And it's to ensure that this team is able to get all 56 of their games in during this year. So games in the Scotiabank North division, uh, which obviously, as we all know, consists of the seven Canadian based teams will finish on May 16th, which I think might mean that the rest of the NHL is done a little while before the Stanley Cup playoffs. So, you know, I feel like you start to get like the angel and devil on your shoulder where you're like, hey, time to rest before the playoffs. This is nice. Oh, shit. My team's going to be sitting before the playoffs and get rusty. So it's a little bit of both. And uh, yeah, read read my mind. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Which would I mean, I have to ask, which way do you guys look at that? I think that there will be more teams sitting and waiting than not. So it's probably fine because it'll be mostly even, but I would, I think my gut, my gut reaction is to prefer to roll right into it because momentum is everything as we know in the playoffs, but I don't know. I mean, it kind of just depends on your team. It'd be interesting to look at stats. I know the caps are one of the best teams in the league after like three full days of rest or something like that, but I'm not familiar with many other stats like that around the league. So it'd be interesting to look into that. Yeah. As a, as a Penns fan, I would prefer the rest just given the amount of injuries that have taken place so far. Still rolling though. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, speaking of injuries, uh, the Jack Edwards call against TJ Oshi the other night in the Caps game. <laughs> Basically, you know, Oshi gets cut with a high stick in a bad one, too. Yeah. No penalty on the play, clearly a double minor, busted his nose like a fire hydrant. I mean, this there thing was, was just there was blood on the ice. It was blood dripping everywhere. blood. Yeah, it was. And Jack Edwards' response to that is, oh, what now? I'm like, really, dude? Like, what is the matter with you? The best part of the clip is what's his colored guy's name again? I asked this last week. Andy Brickley. Weeks. Yeah. Andy Brickley's like, unless it's a penalty on the board. Yeah. And, he, and, he go, and he goes, well, he better be hurt or he shouldn't be ble-, or something like that. I, yeah. I, I, yeah. Haven't, yeah. I haven't watched the clip in a couple it's days. It's such but. a circus move. I, I, uh, it amazes me that this guy still has a job. Honestly, yeah, it kind of does. <laughs> like, yeah. I love, I, I kind of. I don't like him, but I kind of love that we always have stuff to talk about because it's it's funny. The but... day he gets canned is going to be like a league wide holiday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. God. I feel like uh, even a lot of Bruins fans are like this guy's team. Oh, they can't. Uh, half of the Bruins fans like just accept how ridiculous he is, and the other half are like, "This guy is an absolute joke and just makes us yeah, look bad." Right. Yeah. And then there's like that small percentage that they're like, "Oh my god, he's right!" Like, <laughs> yeah, but the worst uh the edmonton oilers swept the senators in all nine games they played against each other this season that's only the second time in nhl history where a team swept another team in at least nine games played in a season last to do it was montreal 76 years ago they swept boston in 1944 and 1945 and that's probably because there was only six teams in the league yeah Um, it's kind of a quirky stat because like it is and it'll probably never happen again yeah because you you know in the last what 30 years you haven't really had teams play each other that yeah but i also find it interesting that it's been 76 years because if you think about it that sweep against boston for montreal's in 44 and 45 i don't think the first expansion was until 67 so that's a 20-year gap yep which is pretty pretty neat i thought that was a cool stat yeah uh just a another quick stat the leading scores in the league since march 1st so the last 
month and a half, month and two weeks, whatever you want to call it. Gabe Landeskog is 31 points and the abs are rolling. Nathan McKinnon has 30 points because the abs are rolling. And Miko Rantanen has 30 points because the abs are rolling. So yes. Colorado is on Jesus. fire right now. And the big guns are just, they're going off. So, um, yeah. I, I, I saw this somewhere. I couldn't find it. I thought I marked it on Twitter or retweeted it or something, but I couldn't find it today. So don't take this as a fact, but I'm pretty sure I read this and I'm going to try and dig it up. The Colorado Avalanche, if you – project what they're doing right now and how they would finish the 56 game season. Right. And then you take that projection and expand it to 82 games. They would beat the lightning's all time points record in a single season that they had two years ago after yeah. when they got swept, they yeah. would break that record by one point. Wow. I now I told Nick that on the phone the other day and he was like, really? I thought that I was like, yeah, I swear I saw it. So don't take it as a fact. Sure. But I'm pretty sure I saw that. That's a cool stat. I mean, yeah, projections like that are fun. Basically just goes to show that they're they're having that caliber of a season. They're that good. Yeah. yeah. I was surprised. I, Harry, what I said to you was it's just, you know, the abs went flat for a little while at the beginning of the season. So they did. Um, yeah, I was surprised that they were able to make up that much ground. But hey, when you've got but that you roster. Know what? I think the Lightning actually had maybe a span of – five or 10 games that were really concerning as well, like that year. And and then they finally just went off after that. Everybody's got to go through that little bit of adversity. Exactly. You know? Yep. All righty. Well, let's get to the meat of this episode. It's time to recap the trade deadline and let's just get this out of the way right now. Um, <laughs> I can't wait for this one. The biggest trade of today I think it's safe to say, or the one that received the most backlash or attention or hoopla, whatever you want to call it. The Washington Capitals receive Anthony Mantha from the Detroit Red Wings. The Red Wings in return receive Jacob Vrana, Big Dick Ponick, a 2021 first round pick and a 2022 second round pick. Mac, initial reactions. And now that we've had about four hours to process it. I want to hear your thoughts. All right. So the first thing I hear is that first of all, there was nothing. There was crickets from the caps. I was pissed. I wanted them to do something. Then I hear we got Michael Raffle and I was like, all right, cool, whatever. It's something we did something. It's not that big of a deal, but like, I'll take it. And honestly, I was content at that point if we didn't do anything else. However, I see the Vrana deal and I hear that it's just Vrana for Mantha um, actually, I saw Ponick's name too. So I was like, okay, it's going to be Vrana and Ponick for Mantha. At that moment, I was sad that Vrana was gone because he's a great, great player. He's done a lot for us. It's sad anytime, anytime somebody from that 2018 Caps team is no longer on the team, you're going to feel some emotion from that for sure. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah. So I'm going to miss him. But in that moment, I was like, okay, Anthony Mantha is a really good player. And there's not a lot of people around the league that, that realize that right away because the thing is, you know, the Red Wings are irrelevant. Nobody's paying attention to them. So there's all these people that are casual NHL fans or Caps fans, but don't pay any attention to other teams around the league. And they're like, Anthony Mantha, who is this guy? This is the worst trade ever. That's why you're seeing so much like, like stuff on Instagram about random like Caps fans commenting and being like, they got fleeced, all this stuff. I've seen that a lot. They got fleeced. Nobody got fleeced. I'll tell you, like, I'll tell you what happened. The Caps made a trade with two players that are comparable and we had to cough up more because of what we're trying to do with the future and trying to get out from underneath two contracts, basically. Ding, ding, ding. Wow. That was the best statement you've ever made. That was so spot on. Good it's, job. It, it's exactly that. What people aren't getting is like dollars and cents. If you add value to what they gave up, is it a little bit of an overpay for Mantha? Probably, but when you're in the win now mentality versus Detroit, who is planning for the next 10 years down the road, you know, acquiring two guys, Vrana, who's still young, two draft picks they can use to build their yeah. franchise. Because we all know what Eiserman can do with a team. He basically built the Lightning. And they're, they're, win now, you have to do it because you can't do this in two years or three years or four years. Exactly. And just to give you some more exact numbers, if you still can't wrap your head around this one, here's, here's really what this boils down to. The Caps 
are paying Jake. We're paying Jacob Rana 3.5, I believe. Um, and he's what signed? He, is he a free agent at the end of the year, or does he have one more? He is year? a free agent at the end. He's of the a year. free agent. Okay, so even even more reason, right? So we're either going to have to re-sign him at the end of the year, and then for a lot him. of money, and also uh, and also re-sign Ovi. Maybe not protect him because there's a thing where you can. Well, no, we would because he's restricted or whatever. So with him, you would have you would have had to re-sign him and protect him. Anyway. With Ovi also needing to be re-signed, you got to keep that in mind. We have a contract where we're paying Dick Panic. No offense, we love the guy, but what? What was he making? Like four million or three million or something like that. Something I mean, he, like that. he was putting a big hit on our cap space for three more years. The main objective was we need to get out from underneath of this Richard Panic contract. Who in the league is going to want to take Richard Panic for three years at three and a half or four million or whatever it is in that little bar ballpark area? The only way we could do it is if we throw in a guy like Vrana and a couple, a couple of picks too, you got to sweeten the deal. There's no way you're like, literally it may seem like I hear a lot of people saying Vrana for Mantha would have been a fair, like one for one trade, which like maybe, but irrelevant because it, it, it's impossible. Vrana after 2018 for Mantha probably could have been entertained and maybe padded with a draft pick or two, but yeah. Also, all these people being like, wow, the Caps just got older and slower. Mantha is one year older than than Vrana. And also, here's the other thing. <sighs> Anthony Mantha, I don't know if a lot of people realize this. I didn't realize this. He's 6'5", like 224 pounds. This is a big... He probably has 80 pounds on Jacob Vrana. This guy is a big, like, power forward sniper. Like, this guy is actually really legit. And when you think about what the Caps are so good at doing, yeah, we don't have that much speed or youth. We are physical, and we will, like, we will get after you and and, then win the physical games. And this guy is only going to add to that and still snipe it like Rana does. So, like, will I miss Rana? Of course. But does this trade make sense? Yes. Case closed. 100% 100% agree. Uh, the comparison I made uh, to Harrison before we started recording is Anthony Mantha has the same playing style to Eric Lindros. And before all you 90s hockey hardos, you know, I'm looking at you guys over the age of 50 start coming <laughs> from my throat. You can't tell me you don't see the similarities there. I mean, big rig, super skilled, great shot. Uh, I forget the guy's name on TSN. Uh, it's going to really bother me but he said if you could design the perfect hockey player it would be eric lindros so uh big power forward skate it's a great skill. combo or a yeah great it really comparison. is and it's in today's league you it's something that you need and a guy that can still move that's that big is basically a weapon on wheels so uh, yeah i completely agree i was a little bit surprised i think you know you nailed it a lot of caps fans aren't paying attention to the red wings or don't know who mantha is and they see us giving up two players and two high picks for one so I get it, but uh, for Caps fans who are you know crying, I'm sad too. Jacob Vrana is one of my favorite players, but uh, this is the right deal at the right time. And I think the other thing we all have to kind of accept is Vrana was making what, three? Uh, yeah, it's three, five. Can you honestly tell me that that was worth it this year? And here's the other thing. Mantha is signed through 2024, I believe. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. And he's making five seven, so it's only a slight increase. You know, if we were going to plan on re-signing Vrana, he's gonna he's gonna want. It more would than be five, around seven. that anyways. E- or, or around there, even though he had a bad year, he could still get like probably six million from somebody around the league for sure. Or like like five at least. So it's I, like right there. I can't believe people are complaining about this. Just a couple thoughts. I mean, I know I'm not the Caps fans here, but I do have some opinions on the trade one i do think the playing style is comparable to lindros obviously he's not going to be lindros he's never even broken 50 points in the season but i would say big body skilled can shoot blah 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 for all you bitching out there caps fans um jacob verona's career high goals was in 2019 2020 with 25 right Anthony Mantha on the worst team in the NHL did that (laughs) in 2018 and 2019. He had 25 tucks and he only played in 67 games and he kills penalties and he can play the power play and he's physical and he's big. And he was a first round pick in 2013. He's not some, you know, Joe blow in the fourth or fifth round, not disrespecting anybody drafted there, but he's a definitely a recognizable name. 
Um, I, I told Nick Who's this been before stuck we stuck on a bad team his whole career. A very exactly. bad team. Exactly. So he he's Jacob Verona's best career season points wise. He had 52 points in the what was it? The 1920 campaign. Anthony Mantha had his career high. He had 48 points in 1819. So you're talking about a four point difference. One plays on a line with world class players. The other plays on a line with Todd Bertuzzi's nephew, I think. <laughs> so, you know, I, I mean, you can't be that mad. Like, he's a good player. Is it a little bit of an overhaul? Yeah, but like, that's what that's the price of winning. That's it's exactly it what Max said. Literally, the Penguins haven't had a first round draft pick. I couldn't even tell you. I I literally can't. We we drafted Kapanen and then traded him a month later for Kessel. So we didn't even get to use him. And then he came back. But right. you'll be fine. Just everybody, calm down. My God. And I understand. I I get the sentimental attachment to it. But I was texting someone today that you know was like, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? And I was like, look, this is what happens when you reach that Stanley Cup point. You know, you win the Stanley Cup. That team is not going to stay together for the next season right. or next five years. You're going to lose guys. It's just the way it goes. I mean, you look at the Lightning and they they lost, what was it, Paquette? And uh, yep. uh, I'm forgetting somebody, uh, Maroon, not not Maroon. They not resigned Maroon. Maroon. But who else did they get? So, anyway, uh, they sent Coburn, Coburn to Ottawa. Right. He's now a in, bunch of guys uh, leave like as soon as they win the cup. It happens sometimes. Like you're gonna lose those guys. The Pens have go. the Pens do not have that many guys left from that back to back team. Yeah. Exactly. It's yeah. it's just the way it goes. And yeah, it sucks. And I'm sure Jake's gonna have a great career with the Red Wings or whoever he ends up with. I'm hey, sure Eiserman is gonna lock him, him up around. Yeah, very I hope soon. He can help. So, so. Also, uh, job, he didn't go anywhere in the division. Yeah. <laughs> like, get him out of here. Detroit, perfect. Perfect. Yes. I don't have to think about him or, like, watch him score a buttload of goals against me and be like, God damn it. Yeah. Uh, move on. That was the first trade we had to get to. Uh, right. Madison <laughs> Bowie uh, and a 2021 fifth rounder to the Canucks. The Blackhawks get a 2021 fourth rounder in return. Uh You'll see why that makes sense right now because Jordy Ben went to the Jets and then the Canucks get a sixth rounder in return for him. I actually like that move for the Jets getting Jordy Ben. They need help on the back end. And, you know, Jordy Ben's a second, third D pairing guy and, you know, can just sort of shut it down. Big body, you know, nasty young D, guy. It's a young D core. They, they, that's a good move for them. Yeah. I think it was a decent move, but I don't think it was as big of a move as a lot of people wanted to see from them, nor do I think it's enough to help them win the Stanley cup. Next. No, I don't. Yeah. I don't either. Uh, Hayden flurry to the ducks. And then the hurricanes get Yanni Hakan pa. What? Uh, and <laughs> 2021 sixth rounder in return. I I'm sorry, but if someone could tell me how to pronounce that, that would definitely be not it. I'm not yeah. going to try it, but yeah. it can't be that for, for but, once. It's not me butchering the name. I mean, I went phonetically with that, but it literally sounded like my, like Wi Fi just cut in and out for a second. Um, <laughs> The other Caps move that we'll uh, talk about now is Michael Roffel comes to the Caps from the Flyers, and the Flyers get a fifth rounder in return. In my opinion, this pretty much just replaces Richard Ponick. Depth yeah, forward. I think, uh, yeah, he's he's a he's a feisty guy. He, he you know he can insert in the lineup if somebody gets hurt easily. He's I mean he's been around the league for a little little bit now he's got got some games under his belt so i feel like that's the kind of guy you can turn to on any given night you're like oh shoot somebody's not available we can toss this guy in It'll exactly be. uh the sharks get alex barabanov from the leafs and the leafs get Auntie suomela in return eric good branson goes to the preds and the senators receive a 2023 seventh round pick and i'm like pretty sure the Sens are going to retain like 50% of Good Branson's salary. Good like Branson's kind of a suitcase at this point. He really is. And I, is. Like, I do like that move a lot, Harry. I agree with you for the Preds. I think that's a good one. I'm a, I'm a big defensive depth guy loading up for a playoff run. That's I, I, Michael Carpney. Yeah. <laughs> Ron Hainsey. Yeah. When yeah, Latang did, wasn't yeah. even. Latang didn't even play our, our 17 run, and Hainsey was logging like 23 minutes a game. That, that's why right. you guys won the cup. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, ben Hutton to the Leafs, and then the Ducks get a fifth rounder in return for that. Eric Gustafson to the Habs, and the Flyers receive a seventh rounder. I, I love yeah, that move. I, yeah, I, I, that's great. A seventh, seventh rounder. That's, I think that's I think that's another one where there's fifty percent retention going back. So 
Right. Um, yes. But that is a great move for the Habs. I like that a lot. I'm Wait, not the really Flyers happy. are retaining half and only getting a seventh rounder for it. I think so. That's. I don't know. The, I, I could be wrong. I don't but, know the contract situation, but I would. Uh, that just. I smell Gustafson Seattle or something. Gu- yeah, Gustafson is a good defender. Yeah, I'm surprised it didn't work out in, in Philly for him, but. Yeah. Oh, well, this one was pretty big. Sam Bennett to the Panthers in exchange for a 2022 second rounder and a prospect. I'm a big fan. I, yeah. uh, I, 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 Sam Bennett's got that playoff mentality. He's a, he's a pain in the ass. He'll get right in your face. He'll fight, kills penalties, takes draws. Nick, he was, or one of you guys probably knows the year he was drafted. He was like a top five pick, I think. Wasn't he? He was up there. He was like a fifth round. I think he was like the fifth overall pick. I, I'm going to mess the year up. I want to say 2014. Um, Would make sense. Yeah, he, it never really worked out in Calgary. I know he had been frustrated there uh, for the past two seasons. You got that right, 2014? Fifth overall? I think so. Holy shit, I'm good. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I like that move for the Panthers. I think they need a little more grit. They're, they're definitely um, loaded in the talent department, so... Good move for them. I think this shows up their penalty kill too. It's fun always seeing like guys that have only been on one team. I mean, the Mantha thing too, and with Bennett, and we saw it with Line A and um, Dubois earlier in the year. But when there's a guy that's been kind of stuck in a team, and you know this guy's a good player, but he just he hasn't he hasn't fit in right with the squad he's on or whatever. It's always fun like the first month or so watching how they adjust with a new team. I feel like it's always like zero or a hundred, like either it doesn't work out again. And you're like, Oh, maybe it's the player or suddenly this guy is like going off. Cause he's just so happy to be like somewhere else for a while. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. Uh, the avalanche trade, Josh Dickinson and Ryder Rolson to the Blackhawks in exchange for Carl Soderberg. I did not know that you were able to trade Yale prep school boys, but uh, okay. That's <laughs> great. Uh, the Golden Knights trade 2021 second rounder and 2022 third rounder to the Blackhawks in exchange for Matthias Janmark. Of course, Decent because one. the Golden Knights get whatever the fuck they want. So, wow. A um, jealousy there, eh? That's it's who just, I had my eye on. All same here. Long. And it's so typical, but yeah, it's just, it's annoying at this point. Mm. Um, the Oilers get some defensive depth. They get Dmitry Kulikov, and the Devils get a conditional 2022 fourth-round pick. I don't hate that move for the Oil at all, but um, I'm sure that'll be the the Band-Aid that pushes them to the Stanley <laughs> Cup. Uh, the Lightning get Frederick Clayson, and the Sharks get Magnus Krona. Blockbuster deal. Hugh, that was the big one of the day. Let's be real. Magnus Krona. Yeah. People are just dying around. Like, oh, he's a goalie. Where's he's Taylor zero. Hall? Right. Wow. <laughs> where's Taylor Hall? Um, the Blackhawks get Adam Gaudet and the Canucks get Matthew Highmore. I like that move a lot. I think Gaudet has a great game for whatever reason. It just wasn't something that Vancouver wanted to keep around. I like him in the Blackhawks lineup. I think he'll fit in very well there. Hawks did well for themselves. Actually. I think they made a lot of really smart moves this year, this deadline. Uh, the Penguins get Jeff Carter from the Kings in return for a conditional 2022 third round pick and a con- conditional 2023 fourth round pick. Harry, what are your thoughts on that? I like the move. Um, I like that we didn't actually give up a roster player. So that's nice because the team's been clicking pretty well. Uh, no surprise, Hextall brings Carter in because Hextall was on that. Uh, he was a m- member of that uh, general management team that got Carter to the Kings when they won the cup. So yeah, I, 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 I like it. I do. He's going to be the third line center. If I had to guess Uh, that kind of fills a void we've been missing. They've been kind of experimenting on and off all year with McCann as the third line center, but honestly, he's playing so much better as a winger. It would be stupid to change that right now. Um, I don't think Jankowski's ready yet to take that third line center. I don't know if he'll ever be ready. He's, he's playing well, but I think he's more of our fourth line guy. The one thing I like, Jeff Carter is not as good as he used to be. He's, you know, 36 years old. He's got some time under his belt. Um, he's got two Stanley Cups. But what I love is that he shoots the fucking puck. 
when he gets the puck. And I'm a, I am the biggest leader of the shoot the puck community. I am that guy. <laughs> I, I scream it constantly. It's bad. Like you're that guy at the games. games. It's oh, always like oh, on, the, on yeah. the power play, like yep. shoot it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I am the shoot the puck guy. And I, Jeff Carter fucking shoots the puck. So I am happy about that. Uh, he has shot the puck more than anybody on our team. So I am not going to complain. We'll get some second power play time. I'd imagine important right-hander on the face-offs. I mean, Malkin, Crosby, Jankowski, they're all lefties. It's nice to have a righty there for the draws. So uh, I, I like it. And I think that he's hungry for another one. And I think it's good that him and Hextall are buddy, buddy. So um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I got a good feeling, about. I don't say this often. I got a good feeling about the Penguins. I'm, I'm a pessimistic fan about everything, no matter what the sport is, but I have a good feeling about this team. Yeah, I don't like to hear that. And also as a division rival, seeing Carter go there, I don't like it. I, I think that's scary down the middle. Crosby, Malk, and Carter, that's that's some serious depth down the middle, and that's what wins you a Stanley Cup is depth down the middle and on so, D. Like we where said. has Carter was in Philly, then Columbus, then L.A., and now Pitt? Yeah. Oh, I forgot about Columbus. He was, was in Columbus short, for like a, a cup of coffee. One. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, nice. So the other big blockbuster move, uh, the Bruins get Taylor Hall and Curtis Lazar. Stop laughing. In exchange for Anders Bjork and a 2021 second round pick. Why the quotation marks? Well, because everyone was up in arms about this. And Mac and I were texting long after you had gone to bed last night and this got gotten released. And I was like, this is such a bogus goofball move <laughs> like and i understand i get it like i get what the sabers are doing like they're just <laughs> trying to get anything for this guy now because they know that they're either gonna have to re-sign him or seattle's gonna have to like scoop him up for free so i get and what they're just doing get but everybody out of there it seems yeah. like they're literally like get everybody out of here right now and i know that hall has not been playing up. He's on a one-year, eight million dollar deal. He is no two goals. He has two goals. He's nowhere worth that money. But you, you got to think he's worth at least five million somewhere. At he's least. still enough of a name that somebody in the league who can afford it will take that chance on him. And because of that, you know you got to at least like give up something for him. But the like the Bruins got off kind of easy. Yeah, yeah, big time. They did. They did. I told Nick this. I don't know if this plays a role in anything. Andres Bjork is very good friends with Jack Eichel. They grew up playing together uh, really? for the junior Bruins. Yeah. So that's something interesting to keep in hmm. mind there. <clears throat> a second round pick. Also, Curtis Lazar is not bad. No, he's Fourth like a decent, line guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's like a total like NHL or like, it's not like that guy's yeah. well, well, no. Cause no, the, yeah, the Bruins that. have actually had um, a bunch of random fucking guys in their lineup recently because mm-hmm. of all their like COVID stuff and injuries and whatnot. But yeah, when we just played them, they had some guy playing. His last name was bleed B L I D H. I saw it on the back of his Jersey. I was like, I don't, what is that? What is that? What is that? People, people have to stop. <laughs> like picking their names from scrabble tiles this is getting out of hand like, <laughs> seriously like that's a scrabble hand dude yeah. and he scored too like on some weird of course like, like, so i propose this question to you guys does this trade put the bruins above one of the three big teams in the division the pens aisles or caps I don't think so just because of the back end. Defense and goaltending are still a big question for the Bruins, as we saw the other night. For sure. Especially with, we don't know how long Rask is going to continue to be out. And do they not even have Halak? What's they going don't. on there? They what don't. happened there? I didn't realize he was it's hurt too. Darth and then some guy that played his <laughs> Darth first. Darth Vladar and yeah. uh, Slayman <laughs> Darth, or Swayman Darth or whatever. Darth yeah. Vader and Seaman. <laughs> yeah. So, literally, that's what it sounds like. Oh, God. Yeah, um, but no, it, it doesn't put them above either of them because of that. But also just because we don't know what Taylor Hall is going to do. Such he a wild could be, card. He could be the same nothing. It could be a Kovalchuk move, right? Or it could be my initial reaction, and this would be scary, is do you guys remember when the Bruins picked up Marcus Johansson at the trade deadline and then they, they went all the way to the game seven against the Blues and Mojo he was a stud. Money. All through the playoffs, all the way through that game seven, he played his fucking heart out. Like that man looked like he wanted a Stanley Cup and he almost got them one, like helped them big time. And he was kind of, wasn't he coming from um, 
uh, Buffalo and, and he, was, he, has, yeah. he hadn't done much there. So it's, it's a very similar thing. It's like, same, same thing with taking Charlie. a big gamble on yes. somebody who should be good. Wasn't good in Buffalo. And we'll see what happens. It's the same thing with Charlie Coyle. He had a sick yeah. playoff run and yeah. he was, he was lost in Minnesota. So mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I kind of see – I mean, I don't think it's possible that he can do any worse. Um, but I do, I do foresee him finding his groove a little bit. Yeah. Apparently, the, the rumor mill was that this came down to the Caps, the Bruins, and the Islanders, which if you're a fan of one of those three teams, it's just terrifying because you're always going to lose with those odds. Yeah. yeah. Also, um, I saw a really funny tweet. I don't necessarily agree with this, but it was like – Wow, Taylor Hall did really good playing uh, next to Jack Eichel in Buffalo. It's going to be way better with him playing next to dot, 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 David Krejci. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you guys see what Curtis Lazar, like he was pretty vocal about leaving Buffalo. He was like, we found some creative ways to lose hockey games and I'm excited to go back there and beat them. <laughs> did, wow. you see, did you see what Hall said? They said, what, yeah. how would you wrap up your stint? Bubba goes, well, it didn't go very well. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, I see. Like, well, obviously it didn't go very well. <laughs> That's another one of those like journalism questions where it's like, really, you're going to ask the guy that we're in, like everyone as a collective unit has been just dumping on this team all year. So, so. Uh, let's move on. The Islanders get Braden Coburn. Nope. Don't like that. Uh, and the senators get a 2022 seventh round pick. So. The, fit, fits the, the Islanders to a T. It's he just, yeah. Rough son of a, this reminds me of a, uh, not as good, but a lesser degree of a Johnny Boychuk trade. Yes. Ever since no. he got belted in the eye, but yeah. yeah. This reminds me of when you're playing Monopoly with like your little cousin who's only like seven years old, and you're like, "Yeah, dude, trade me Boardwalk for like one of those light blue guys over there. Like, we'll we'll like make it up to you later. I'll like do your homework. I'll help you with your homework tomorrow or something like that." And the kid's like, "Okay," and just does it. And like, all right, thanks, sucker. They're I'm never gonna learn homework. if like, everything's just handed to them. So you have yeah. to teach them somehow, but. Yeah, I, we were texting about this <laughs> earlier, and I said the East Division at this point is just an arms race. And it was at that point that the Caps hadn't made any moves yet, so that's when you're starting to like get stressed out here because it's like, okay, the yeah. Bruins are doing something, the Penguins are doing something, and the Islanders just seem to keep doing everything to get yeah. better. <laughs> it's like, could the Caps just do something, please? Yeah. Well, that's why I was like freaking out, and then finally we got Raffle, and I was like, God, okay, well, at least we did something. Something. <laughs> Thank and then you. Mantha came and the whole fan base just fell yeah, apart. Exactly. Shit. But I mean, I honestly feel comfortable now. I'm like, okay, cool. We did actually something really big. So let's yeah. see. Uh, the Bruins did some more. They got Mike Riley to help out on the back end. The Senators, they are just loading up on draft picks. <laughs> just giving people away. They're having a yard sale. Yep. They get a 2022 third rounder in return. Probably... If you're north of the border, the biggest trade to happen at this trade deadline, the Maple Leafs get Nick Foligno and Stefan Nosen. The Blue Jackets get a 2021 first round pick from the Leafs, a 2022 first round pick from the Leafs, and the Sharks get a 2021 fourth round pick from Toronto. I like that, you know, a little three-way action. Nice. You know, got to love that. So, yeah, what's up? The Toronto Maple Leafs are the favorites to win the Stanley Cup. Harry's big on the Leafs. They're yeah. like his second favorite team for some reason. Well, I, no, you don't say don't say that just yet because he's got such a boner for the Golden Knights just because Flurry went there. That you that's know. true. It's it's like every how can you not it's like, like every the Leafs? Pats fan being like, I love the Buccaneers now. Like you know, Leafs. Can- I I don't hate the team at all. I want the team to succeed in some ways, but uh, it's the fans the fan base is so goddamn annoying. Yeah. I but can't I can't fucking stand them. It's- Sorry, Rick Rowley. I know. <laughs> no, Rick's great, but Rick owns it. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah. How can you not root for the Leafs? Like the Matt, the, like I love Matthews. Probably like when Crosby retires and Malkin retires and all the pens are gone, that's gonna be my guy. Like I, I love him. I love Nylander's like swag. I kind of hate Tavares, but I can get over it. You know, I like Marner. He's kind of geeky. I like Morgan Riley. Seems cool. It's but... weird to me that Tavares is the captain of that team. Like that doesn't. It just really doesn't make, make sense, sense to, to me at all. Yeah. But relating to the trade, I mean, this is basically win now. Felino is a great two-way player. Yeah. He'll help that penalty kill. He can score. He brings leadership. He's still cup hungry. I mean, 
what more can you say? It's a great trade for the Leafs. Yeah, uh, they're going to have a very interesting time looking at their books a couple years down the road. But you're right. Win now. Go for it. Do it while you can. They got Joe Thornton. How can you not root for that? Did you see the stat today? It was like, well, yeah, you have to root for Jumbo Jumbo, because now that Ovi's won it. I mean, how can you not root for Jumbo? And Hank's out, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 Um, Yeah. But like they have Nick Foligno, who is a captain in Columbus. Tavares was a captain on the island. Thornton was a captain in San Jose. And yeah. Who, Jeez, yeah. who else am I missing? There's someone else. When you else. put it There's that way. One. Spezza was the captain uh, in Ottawa. was a captain oh, in Ottawa. Shit. Yeah. God damn. And Spezza yeah. has what you have to root for oh, the Leafs. They're a yeah. likable team. Come on. I, That's I'm on a the scary Leafs. team. You're right. I, I'm like, on the Leafs me, <clears throat> Like I want them to do it because I want to see what that city will do to itself if they win a Stanley Cup. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. It's I just going to collapse. You know, it's going to uh, collapse in on itself. You know how Vancouver burned couches because they lost? <laughs> Toronto would burn like fucking the city because they won. Yeah. It would be yeah. absurd. Vancouver <laughs> flipped over a bus. Toronto's going to like throw a bus in the river or something. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and plus the whole Jack Campbell thing we just talked about. Like, how can you not root for this team? They're awesome. I, 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 they, I love the Leafs. I hope they, if the Pens don't win it, I hope the Leafs win it, honestly. Fair enough. Are you going to put money on them? I did that last year. It didn't work out too well. But Let's go Habs. I can't get on that wagon. Uh, maybe. We'll see. I, they're too hot right now. You got to get the value down a little bit. So, I don't know. I like the trade. That was really the bottom line. Makes sense. I agree. I think that's a great move for them because as if they weren't loaded up front enough, this is just depth for them. And a guy that... I think Nick Foligno is a gamer and I, that's why oh, yeah. I've always hated him is because he's annoying as hell to play against. Yep. Uh, speaking of depth, the Habs boost their defensive depth with John Merrill. And then in return, the Red Wings get Hayden Verbeek and a fifth round pick to match that. The Devils get Jonas Siegenthaler from the Caps who also send or who get a 2021 conditional third rounder in return. Rip. Yeah, sad to see Sieg's go, and I think Siegenthaler will be a top six NHL defenseman for sure. He's got the size, he's got the skating. So uh, sad to see him go, but I think this was the right move given the cap salary cap issues right now. And I think a conditional third is probably what you can expect in return for something like that. It's a fair deal, and I, on the bright side, I, I think it's good that he gets to play because honestly, he's a hell of a defenseman, and he's only getting older, and he hadn't played in over a month with the Caps because we're just so you know, so, we're so fine with the six guys we've had back like there. Nine defensemen. I know. Yeah. It's a shame. So I hate to see him just sitting on the shelf with us. So, you know, you can at least be happy that the guy's going to get in the lineup over there. I, I'm just processing this in my brain. Sorry. I'm still thinking about the Leafs. Has there <sighs> ever, has there ever been a team that's had four previous captains that have never won a Stanley cup all on the same team? I highly doubt it. I feel like there's that's probably crazy. not many teams that have just had four previous captains, yeah. period. Like That's fucking period. nuts. Again, how can you not root for them? Spets has never won it. Yeah, Spets has never won it. No. I don't want Tavares to win it, but whatever. Um, Spets went to the finals, but he hasn't won it. And he lost. And Felino's never won it. Thornton's never won. It's like, how can you not root for them? Out of all yeah. those guys, I care the most about Spezza, honestly. Like, Jumbo, yeah. like, Same. I know I got to root for him, but honestly, like, it's kind of a dick. I didn't like this one hit he made on, like, Oshi last year. So, whatever. I'm, a a, I'm looking at a at a game-used Jason Spezza hockey stick in my room right now, actually. One of the white Sherwoods? Spezza's sick. It's a he... Easton Stealth CX that's, like, silver on the Oof. bottom, black up top. It's And then it's just an absolute banana on the on the blade <laughs> yeah. um speaking of deeper teams getting deeper this is frustrating the lightning get david savard brian Lashoff from the blue jackets the blue jackets get a 2021 first round pick from the bolts and a 2022 third round pick from the bolts and then the red wings get a 2021 fourth round pick so another three-way i mean teams were feeling freaky this year so <laughs> um yeah i don't like david savard to the bolts at all uh yeah just like you said make some deeper first round pick those a little steep in my opinion but i kind you know of agree what? when yeah. now when now yeah. i think yeah exactly and i think they had to do that to complete that love triangle but 
Uh, also, let's not forget, uh, and this goes back to with the Caps first rounder, anybody that's given up a first rounder or really any 2021 first or second or third round picks, we talked about we don't even know what the value of those are like at all at this point. It because could be significantly diminished in what we've seen in years past. So We just don't know what the hell this draft is going to look like because nobody's been scouting and, and nobody's been playing and, and all that. So it it it's a little bit more of a gamble than any normal given first round pick like that. You totally know, like, I mean, think about it last year. If somebody trades you the first round pick, you're like, Holy shit. Like if I'm in the top five, I can get like a really good play, you know, like yeah. whatever, but yeah. we don't know what the hell the draft is going to look like for 2021. So it's a little bit more of a gamble. Exactly. Uh, I don't know about you guys. I was a little bit surprised that more goalies did not get moved at this deadline, but probably the most notable one is the avalanche get Devin Dubnik from the sharks who send back Greg pattern in return and a 2021 fifth round pick. I think that's a great move for the abs who basically their one blemish all year has been goaltending. So Dubnik can start games and Dubnik can start games in the playoffs and win. And we've seen that in the past. So Gruber, Grubauer and Dubnik one, two for the abs lookouts. That's good. That's pretty damn good. And even if they have to, if somebody's injured and they have to turn to Franco's, he's like totally fine to be a third stringer at that yeah. point. Um, I'm mostly surprised that a, a team that needed goaltending more didn't shell out more to get Dubnik. Like I, I love this move for the Avalanche, but I'm surprised they were able to get away with it. Like I thought a lot more teams that are really desperate for goaltending would have been gunning harder for him. But I, I yeah, I completely agree. Joe Sackick. Yeah. Yeah. What are you gonna do? Uh the Panthers get defenseman <clears throat> Brandon Montour from the Sabres, who in return get a 2021 third rounder. Good move I for love the Cats. That one, actually. Yeah. I think he's been really good for Buffalo, and that's saying something too when you you're actually standing out a little bit in Buffalo. Um that's a great move for the Panthers. Yeah. The abs basically do the same thing. They get Patrick Nemeth from the Red Wings who send back a 2022 fourth rounder in return. Just another defensive depth move, which solid. the abs are pretty solid on the back end right now. But like you guys have talked about, if someone gets hurt, you know, riding with six, seven, eight, nine defensemen, this just seems to be the way teams are going this year. So uh, definitely a smart move for them. The Leafs get Riley Nash. Uh, from the Blue Jackets and send back a 2022 seventh round pick, just forward depth, bottom six. So uh, yeah, not too much to say there. Uh, the Blackhawks get Brett Connolly, Riley Stillman, and Henrik Borgstrom and a 2021 seventh round pick. And in return, the Cats get Lucas Carlson and Lucas Walmark. I think the Blackhawks, Mac, you said earlier, they did great this trade deadline. Yeah, And I think this was one of their better moves. That's a great move. Kano is a gamer. He's far from done yet. Um, he, especially in a team like Chicago, suddenly he's like a, one of the most veteran players over there on a, on a pretty young roster. Uh, and I think he can provide a lot of uh, depth, but also just like good locker room guy for them to have right now. Probably. I mean, he's got a cup with the caps. He's been around a couple different teams in the league. So he's got some uh, miles on him. Yeah, for sure. And uh, let's not forget that Henrik Borgstrom did win a national championship with Denver. So definitely a guy that knows how to bring it in big moments. Uh, the New York Islanders, this was a little bit prior to the trade deadline, but only by about, you know, the handful of hours. So the Islanders get Kyle Palmieri and Travis Zajac from the Devils, who in return get AJ Greer, Mason Jobst, a 2021 first rounder and a 2022 fourth rounder. I know this was sort of the the spark that set off the trade deadline. This was the first big move that started to get everything moving. What did you guys think of this one? Well, like you said, it was the first domino to fall and it's one of the worst ones for me, in my opinion, Paul Mary didn't waste any time. He got on the score sheet, scored a goal his first game with the Isles. Um, I, I don't like that move. If you're anyone except the Islanders and you're in the East division, this was the best trade deadline transaction in my opinion Lou Lou being Lou you know he does his thing <clears throat> um yeah like Max said Palmieri already on the score sheet here's the thing I told you guys Palmieri's probably the fancy name in this I think Zajac is drastically forgotten about one because the Devils haven't been relevant in a while two because he's kind of a name that has just fallen by the wayside but he's played for Jersey his entire career thousand and games 
Yeah, and we he's figured got... out that he just missed that cup, right? That that's what we. Yeah, yeah. He and was he... post lockout. Right. He was. He was after. He was the season. I think after the Devils won the cup. So his rookie year, I believe, was the year the Lightning won the cup. But he went on a lot of decent runs with that old Devils team that had Scott mm-hmm. Gomez and Marty Brodeur. I mean, this is a guy that yep. has been around for a while, and he's still got talent. Yeah, he's definitely been around. So he's a great two-way player, um, a solid right-handed guy who will win face-offs, kill penalties. He's got some offensive upside to him. So I really like this trade for the Islanders. And even though Paul Mary is a great fit and he's going to do great, and we're already seeing that, I think Zajac might be a diamond in the rough here. Yeah, I completely agree. And Mac, just completely echoing what you said, I cannot stand this move. If you're anyone aside from the it's Islanders, scary. you heard from scary. So scary, man. You heard from Dean about this? I have. He was very excited about this. Hmm, good for him. He also did respond to our story today, checking in on my mental health after Verona got traded. So. I saw yeah, I saw, so what yeah. happens in playoff series when you guys play the Isles? Are you two like friends? Or We are very civil because we were actually on vacation together last year during the first half of that uh ass blasting that the islanders gave the caps and it was it was super professional super you know like hey we're at the beach we're having fun it's like (laughs) and we're we're both like repeatedly checking the scores because our our girlfriends who are cousins were getting mad at us they're like you guys are on like our family vacation like put the phones away and like you know like you know mingle and you know talk to people don't just like hide over in the corner of the pool looking like you're doing something a little weird but um (laughs) you know so you know we would catch parts of the games when we could and i told him when we were there i was like this is over i mean this is so over so well that's good you keep it civil yeah for now yeah a scholar and a gentleman there you go um, the Blackhawks get Vinny Henestroza in exchange for the Cats getting Brad Morrison. Uh, and then the Maple Leafs get David Riddick in exchange for a 2022 third round pick, which goes back to Calgary. And that pretty much wraps up all the trades that happened. Uh, Riddick was really the only other goalie that was moved other than Dubnik. And of course, the big one being uh, Mangus, whatever his name was. Um, <laughs> Uh, so a couple signings to get to Scotty Lawton, who was a pretty big name out there on the, uh, you know, the trade docket. A lot of people thought he was going to get moved, um, signs a five-year extension with the flyers, an AAV of 3 million Mac, You're making me laugh. What's going on? Right now? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just that his name is funny enough as it is Mac. <laughs> <laughs> but you called him Mangus, yeah. and that just that just sent me um, oh. <laughs> inside joke. If you know, your brain is already gone. Um, <laughs> oh god, oh, god. Alex Ayafalo, another guy who I thought for sure was going to get moved. I thought someone was going to you know pay a pretty penny to get him, and he signs a four year extension with the Kings, carrying <clears throat> an AAV of four million. Uh, and then amidst their little COVID powwow, Tanner Pearson signs a three-year extension with the Canucks with an AAV of $3.25 million, which I, I like that deal for the Canucks. I think he's a good player for them to have. It's sort of – Toffoli didn't work out there, and I think Tanner Pearson is a good fit for that team. Seems like the Kings think that they can turn things around pretty soon. I like I feel I like get it. I feel like they think that they can like make the playoffs like next year. And I don't know if that, it, maybe it's true. I don't know. But yeah, they're in that maybe, Eichel sweepstakes. Don't kid yourself. Maybe yeah. if they're like eight rookies all put up 25. Well, that's points. what I'm saying. I mean, yeah. if they get, if, if they get what they're supposed to get earlier or something, maybe, but who knows? I think the Kings will be good sooner than later. Oh, I, I do I too. Know. And same with the ducks. Don't sleep on them. Yeah, it's true. Uh, two waiver claims to get to today that uh, I think these are actually pretty significant. Ottawa gets Victor Mete from the Habs. I think that's a good move for, mm-hmm. for the Sens. Vete's a fleet-footed, puck-moving defenseman. Did you say Vete? Mete. I, know, I think you just said Vete merging the two names. He yeah. did. I did. Okay. <laughs> I like that. Vete. Vete. Um, Dallas gets Sammy Votnin from the Devils. Yeah, I like that. I like Dallas that move, is, too. I, they're str- you know. they're, they need something. Yeah. Yeah, think about who he's joining on that Dallas back end. Yeah, I feel like every week we have a uh, Mero Heiskin update for fantasy yeah. <laughs> purposes, so I, I, I'm following along pretty well. I was a little bit surprised that the Stars didn't try and move Alexiak, or didn't yeah. move. They I, did, didn't, didn't they? Oh, no, they didn't. Yeah, or didn't move him. I'm sure they tried, but... 
Hang on. Wait, no. I thought I read this. I think he got moved, didn't he? I swear this. (sighs) I don't think he did. And then when I said that, my Echo device just went off. But um, maybe maybe not. not. I guess he scored a highlight. Saw. He scored a highlight real goal the other night. Did you see that? Yeah, I did. End to end. Yeah, and um, luckily the Predators held on in that shootout because it really saved my bacon. Alexiak stayed, my bad. Okay. Yeah. I thought he got traded to Edmonton. My bad. I thought I saw something like that too. I think it was like close he, at a couple different he points. He was and then all it just didn't over TSN. Out. Like they yeah. were like, this guy's going, it's going to happen. Just yeah. wait. And then of course he, he doesn't, but imagine what that's like as a player. I mean, maybe you're not super in tune with it. Cause you just try not to pay attention, but like, you got to think like you got, there's gotta be some inkling of like, Oh shit. I'm like, I might get moved and then you just don't. And you're like, I feel oh, like as okay. a player, I couldn't watch, like I couldn't sit there. If, like you've, no. you had an off day and watch yeah. like trade center. No, I couldn't. No, not at all. And I think most of them probably don't. Yeah. Um, I think yeah, that wraps it up. That wraps up all the trades. Uh, I know that was a lot of information to process. My brain is scrambled. So um, <laughs> not too many injuries to get to. So uh, let's go ahead and move it on to our Jim Toft interview. But before we do, Harry has a little bit about Brackish Life for you guys. Of course, per usual, let's take a minute to talk about Brackish Life. If you're like us and grew up on the water and outdoors, then Brackish Life is perfect for you. They have a wide selection of gear from UV shirts to hoodies and hats. It's Real Bay apparel made by Real Bay people. Head to www.brackish.life today to check them out. A little salty, a little fresh, Brackish Life. Brackish Life has also teamed up with Rink to Reef Chesapeake Bay to preserve the area many of us call home. Rink to Reef repurposes broken hockey sticks into oyster restoration habitats. Brackish Life donates a portion of their proceeds to Rink to Reef to Further preserve the beautiful Chesapeake Bay area. Support this great cause by checking out www.brackish.life today. I can't stress this enough. Their hats are awesome. If you're an outdoorsman, they look great. You look good. Their UV shirts are great. I didn't get any sunburn at the beach because guess what? I wore Brackish Life apparel. So there you go. It's not that hard. I feel like every time I'm at the beach, someone asks me like, where did you get that shirt? Or where did you get that hat? And And it just says Brackish Life on it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're like, like, oh, look at this. I'm like, well, if you use your advanced detective skills, you could probably tell that I got it from Brackish Life. But <laughs> yeah, I got a couple compliments on my hat. The red, white and blue one. Nice. Big fan. I, ro- I love this visor. I will be wearing this golfing at some point this summer, I promise. So, yeah, I'm excited. Nice. Any- Anyways, let's toss it off to Jim right now. And it's now my pleasure to welcome to the Empty Betters podcast, Mr. Jim Toff. Jim, thanks so much for taking the time to sit down with us. How are things going for you? They're going great. My pleasure to be on with you guys. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to tell some stories and talk hockey. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, you know, you were a referee for so many years across a bunch of, you know, minor pro and collegiate leagues. So um, I'm sure we'll get to all the, the great stories in a little bit. But why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, where you grew up and how you got into the game of hockey uh, in the first place? Sure. Uh, so I grew up in Binghamton, New York, and my love affair with hockey, I guess you call it, um, started with the Broom Dusters. That was our uh, North American Hockey League team. Basically, that league is portrayed as the old iron league. Uh, So all the slap shot characters from the movie, um, our local uh, star player named Roddy Bloomfield, he was the stunt skater for Paul Newman. Okay. I had his Jersey number five uh, and a lot of the local players played in that league and they, a lot of them were in the movie. Wow. A lot of them are still around today. So uh, my love of hockey started by going to these, uh, these games and about the same time, we started playing street hockey. Uh, there wasn't a lot of ice around. Hockey came to the Binghamton area in the 70s. And Binghamton area was a big industrial city back in the day. Um, it's kind of just like the slap shot story. You know, all the jobs are going. They're closing the mill, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, but, yeah, it started back then watching these guys play. And every game was like the movie Slap Shot. Uh, one guy dropped the gloves. And it was everybody squared up. It, you know, the games took three, four hours, you know, we're now a game is two hours and out. Sure. So yeah, it wasn't uncommon for the benches to empty and, and at our arena, it was a brand new arena, you know, urban renewal. And they had these seats and the armrests, there was some problem with them and they came off. So people would throw them on the ice. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, so 
it was crazy. Um, yeah, so uh, friends got me together with them, and I wasn't a good baseball player. My father passed away at an early age, so I didn't have that parental advantage, if you know what I mean, whether it's playing catch with me a lot or having that influence with local coaches and stuff. So baseball wasn't my thing, and hockey was new and exciting. And uh, somebody gave me a hockey stick, invited me to play a little street hockey in a bank parking lot on a Sunday, and um, I just had an act for it. I just put a bunch of pucks in the net, and everyone's like, you played before? I'm like, no, this is pretty cool. I like it though. And so that, that's where it started. Um, and then I, you know, moved on and we, we did a couple skating sessions at our local rink. The only rink we had besides the, the, the main arena where the team played. Um, and okay, this is pretty fun. And we weren't, we didn't have a lot of means growing up and you know, that sport it, it still is today pretty darn expensive. So sure. um, told my mom, I wanted to try it out and Somehow she scraped some money together and sent me to a local hockey camp. And uh, my first coach uh, was an NHL coach. So that was pretty cool at like age eight or nine. Uh, Larry yeah. coached the Hartford Whalers and uh, actually coached in Binghamton for a while. Um, so, you know, that was where my love affair began playing, uh, playing in that camp. And, um, you know, soon after that, uh, you know, we try to find any piece of ice we can. So I don't know how it is in Maryland. Things would seem like they freezed over a little better up here as a kid. One day we're walking home from school. We take a shortcut through the church. There's an empty lot. And all of a sudden we're there's ice under it. And so we're like, we start kicking it around. God gave us this awesome sheet of ice. Wow. We like 40 by a hundred and hundred feet. And we shovel it off and the church didn't seem to mind. So we played there. Uh, there was a place across the street from my house where a couple lived. They were, blind, dumb, and deaf. Get this. Um, only certain people communicated with them, but we would walk through their backyard and they didn't have any idea we were there. And again, same thing. Oh, there's a patch of uh, drainage that uh, froze up. And so we'd be out there and they had no clue that we were out there in their backyard, basically trespassing. The whole neighborhood was there. And so those are the kind of things that made up my early days, um, you know, at that time. So, uh, yeah, that was uh, kind of how it started. And then after that, it was hockey, hockey, hockey. But, you know, being you know, be 11, 12 years old, I didn't realize, you know, the costs and, and what it's involved in. Our, and our coaches at the time, there, it wasn't a hockey. Hockey wasn't in Binghamton until like 1972 or 73. So the coaches who coach hockey coach baseball and football, and they just watched and And they, they, they winged it. And, uh, like, you know, later on, obviously things got better my generation and maybe just slightly before uh, people played hockey. And so when they came time to coach, they had that experience and just a quick, quick closure on that whole broom duster generation. A lot of those players stayed around uh, and, sure. you know, met the local girls and married. Um, so the, the gentleman who brought the team to Binghamton was a first cousin of Bobby Orr. His name was Jim Matthews. He's from Perry sound, Ontario. So Billy Orr, uh, you know, and another brother, I can't think of his name at the moment, all played in Binghamton. Bobby would come here a lot. Um, not that I saw or remembered him, but yeah, so this guy owned car dealerships and things and very big entrepreneur. So all these guys still, some of them still work at the car dealerships. Wow. We have a minor league career and here's this guy just giving you a career. And some of the guys have done really well for themselves. Yeah. So then, uh, you know, then from there, we played our local high school hockey, probably like Maryland, I'm guessing, maybe club hockey. Um, like in New York, there's varsity hockey, but it's more towards Syracuse uh, and sporadically, you know, Utica, Ithaca, there's a team. Um, so our, our high school hockey, it was like eight teams. To us, it was the best there was, um, but it wasn't varsity. The school didn't pay for it. We had to raise the money, and that was, you know, a big deal, especially being a, you know, kid of a single mom uh, trying to make it. So. You know, that's how we went about it and I always had the love for it. And uh, then I went to community college to study civil engineering. I wanted to get two years at a community college and transfer on. And it was a pretty tough course load. So I didn't play hockey right away, um, but I still not for the team, but I kept playing, improved my game. And then I did that third year of community college. You know, I'm almost a professor by that point. Um, and then I decided to play uh, there and then. I uh, transferred over to Binghamton University, which was uh, a new D3 team in the um, ECAC at that time. And uh, we had a part-time coach. We didn't own our rink. Of course, 
the car dealer who sponsored the dusters owned the rink and he gave us the ice. So that was great. But the ice time was uh, 7 to 8.30 every morning. That was a rough yep. one. Um, and, and continued from there. And uh, our hockey team, we weren't great. We had a record losing streak. Um, so we played in the SUNYAC division of uh, the ECAC. So we played a lot of SUNY schools. Uh, when I say SUNY schools, you're talking SUNY Potsdam. You know, I heard your interview with Courtney talking about the SUNY <laughs> and things like that. Um, but uh, you know, SUNY Plattsburgh, the whole town comes out to the games. It's it's the biggest thing in town, like, you know, Oswego, Potsdam. Um, so we'd play those schools, but then we'd also have these uh, non-league games where we'd play RIT, Mercyhurst, uh, Canisius, all these teams that are all D1 now. And they were pretty much then. I remember playing Army once. It's like, why are we playing these? We need a win. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we finally got one after my, in my second season, uh, against St. Bonaventure University, which was a, they had a D3 team. Oh, yeah. At the time, but, um, that was our, our lore of our, our hockey career. So when we finally broke our, our losing streak, not to dwell on my illustrious playing career on the third and fourth line, but when we won, uh, they broadcast the game. They, our local rink, they filled it up with uh, students. They had bust them over. So if you watch a video of that game and they somebody was broadcasting it, it looked like I used to tell girls I'd play the video. This is when we won the NCAAs. <laughs> on the ice. No clue, you know. So that was the pretty much the, the end of my illustrious uh, playing career. Um, but at that time, I met a good friend, and he, uh, he was a former player. He played the year before, but he had been roughing since he's been a teenager, and he was in the program, let's say, and he, he was trying to get more guys to referee. And he said, you know, you're on, the, you're on the, you're the fourth line center, third line winger at best. You should referee. No one's going to care. So I started refereeing and doing the kids' games, and uh, – found it pretty easy and it was nice to be on the ice and people are paying you to skate and exercise. So um, it grew from there. And I, and I can share a little more of that as we continue. I just been talking a little while there. Sure. Not a problem. Yeah. Ice for us was pretty much the same as you. It was a lot of roller, a lot of street, like whenever you could get ice, it was either really early, really late. I mean, my high school had to combine with two others just to field a club team. So um, yeah, definitely sort of the same. And it's, it's great to hear that, you know, sort of like Slapshot, a lot of those guys stayed in the community and stayed involved and then sort of, you know, paid it forward, whether, you know, like you said, the car dealership sponsoring the team and, you know, sponsoring you guys getting ice time. So that's great to hear. So those personalities. So like, uh, Ogie Oglethorpe was <laughs> played yeah. here. He played against the Binghamton team and then somehow they ended up with him on the team. And somehow he, there, I remember some jail thing, you know, like, you know, almost out of, out of jail, you know, <laughs> there was another character. I remember uh, as far as uh, hockey lore goes, a guy named Spinner Spencer. Yeah. Um, and I remember playing pool with him at the bar across from the arena at like age 10 years old. My, my best friend's mom was a waitress there and she took us to lunch. She's like, oh, you want to go see all the hockey players? And here it is like noon on a Tuesday. And, you know, there they are players in there just boozing it up. Sounds about right. Spinner Spencer was playing pool and he's like, he let us play with him. We're shooting pool with a guy. And then he went on to a career and, and had some ups and, and downs as a tragedy in his life. And yeah. then a few years later, you're reading the hockey news that he was killed in Florida and a bad drug deal or something like that. Yeah. You know, definitely the, the uh, infamous uh, world of hockey there. Uh, but that was, that was certainly pretty cool. Yeah, so, uh, you know, officiating, my, my buddy got me into it. Um, I did the kids' games and worked my way through high school, maybe within two years, because, you know, you play, you can skate, you know the game pretty well. And then I said, I want to do something more with this. And I, I talked to one of my friends. His dad was one of the owners of the, the, I think it was the Binghamton Whalers at the time. So they were the Hartford affiliate. And he's like, oh, my, my dad's on the Board of Governors. He knows the NHL guys and all this. And so I was at a game, and he introduced me to Brian Lewis. Brian Lewis is a former NHL referee. He was at the time, he was the director of officiating. So, you know, I remember going up to him at a game and the game was over, but there was a little scrum going on and he's watching it. And I'm like, sir, sir, you know, can I ask you a question? You know? And finally he talked to me and I said, yeah, I'm a, I'm a local official and I really want to, uh, you know, try to see where I can go with this. And he looked at me up and down and I got a 22 inch neck and I, I'm over six foot and I'm pretty goony looking. And he's like, let me get your name and number. And uh, a couple of weeks goes by and I get a pamphlet from this hockey camp. 
for officials out in New England. And uh, I was like, oh, cool, interesting. I'm reading a brochure and I didn't have a lot of money, but it was a few hundred bucks to go to this thing. And um, it was ran by Kevin Collins, uh, famous NHL linesman, the guy with the big, big hair, the Afro, yep. Yep. never wore a helmet back in the day. Um, it was ran by him. And so I, I looked at the brochure and it said novice or professional. And I'm like, I mean, I've mastered everything at the novice level. God, let's check pro. And I, I click it and I, I scrape some money together, hop in my car and, and drive out to Connecticut. I made arrangements to stay with a friend to save money. And so I, I show up at the camp, right? And, you know, here I'm like, you know, wearing maybe shorts, a t-shirt. And there's these dudes that are look like you're in the movie Top Gun and all this testosterone, all this perfect hair. You're like, how's it going, man? You, you worked the Coast Lake this year. Where'd you work? You know, I'm looking like, damn, these guys take it pretty serious. And, and, and then you get in the dressing room and everyone has these monogram bags and the logos from, you know, some guys are in NHL training programs. Some of those, some of them are in the A and work in other leagues. And, and here I am with a glorified duffel bag, not even a hockey rough bag or anything like that. My helmet was a white helmet, which I spray painted. My, uh, I had a referee sweater somebody gave me to get me into officiating. I had trousers. I think they're from extra large from the Salvation Army to, to go over some pads that I slapped together. It, and my skates were still wet from playing the night before. <laughs> it, but these guys were all polished. I'm like, wow. And, and that, was, that was the first eye opener. And then uh, we get out on the ice and, uh, you know, could skate with them pretty much, but I still had the sloppy hockey player skating. And these guys were, you know, the idea with the officiating to not be noticed, smooth skating. You don't need to cross over so much. They want you just to, to turn and do C cuts and all this stuff that makes officiating skating different from a player. Um, and, and I hung with them for a little while. Um, but the problem was, is my lodging was dependent upon a buddy of mine. And this friend, his, his dad won five Stanley Cups with the Montreal Canadiens. He used to coach in Hartford and, and then in Binghamton. And so they lived in Connecticut right over in Hartford. So I, I stayed with him. Um, his parents were away. And I, I said, how I, how I can pay for this room is to take this guy out for drinks. And so this is night after skating and camp and all this. And we go out and a couple of drinks turns into 13 or 14. And I somehow we get back to his place and I wake up and I go to camp all, you know, big swollen head and everything else. And I think some of the other officials did as well. And I remember Kevin Collins dragging a big old garbage can to the middle of the ice. And he said, some of you guys like to stay up in uh Hoot with the owls. Well, you're gonna you're gonna wake up and soar with the eagles now. He said, "If you got the buckets <laughs> right here, let's go, boys." And, and and that's how that started. Next night, it was pretty much a, a mirror of the same thing. Um, I, I'm like, all right, I should have prepared better for this. Um, grunted, gutted it out through camp that day, and the, the very last day was like a, a dinner. They gave you some certificates they made, and there were some people there to talk to you about leagues. Um, so my choice was to go to my buddy Luke's house and have to sponsor his, uh, his evening and have another rough night or leave. So I left, my buddy lived down the road in Connecticut and I called him up and he's like, yeah, come on, stay. And I, so I basically blew off the, the grand finale of the camp. And uh, I said, I, I learned enough. And by that time uh, I had gotten home and I said, all right, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to put some effort into it. I'm going to invest some money into equipment and, and work really hard and learn everything I could. Um, so, so that year I progressed pretty quickly and USA hockey program recognized me and sent me to the uh, regional development camp up in Lake Placid. And, and, and there I met, you know, maybe 26 other officials from around the country uh, that we trained with. We, the, how the day worked typically was you wake up uh, six, six o'clock or so and you run around Mirror Lake. And I'm not a runner. I'm not built like a runner. I'm a sprinter of anything and, and, and not that. Um, so we run around the lake. And to me, it was like a marathon. It was probably like three miles, three or four miles. But to me, it was like 10. And then we end up at the, uh, at the big Olympic rink. And then we do power skating for an hour and a half. And then we have breakfast. And that's how the day went. And then you had other sessions. And then in the evening, you would referee the kids that are in the national development program that are trying to make a spot in USA uh, development teams and things like that so those were some long days there 
Um, so I did pretty well there. Um, got a good introduction to things and took that. Next year, I was invited back to the uh, National Development Program. So I was one of, I think, 13, don't quote me on that, guys from the, around the country. And that was a pretty big deal. And you know, a lot of these guys were working the big leagues and things like that. And um, actually, in, in, my, uh, in my class, one of the instructors just got hired by the NHL. He was from uh, Albany, New York. Another instructor was hired the year before. He was from Buffalo, New York. So here's some New York guys and, and you know, they're instructors and they're under contract with the NHL. And so I did pretty well at the camp. I had my exit interview and they like, you need to be working the American hockey league. You need to be working pro hockey, stop playing hockey and concentrate on officiating. I'm like, cool. Um, so, and, and that's where it started. So I got a offer from the East coast hockey league to, you know, come and do games. And the closest city was close to five hours away. Uh, for a hundred dollar bill uh, as a linesman. Yeah. Uh, so I, most of my career, you look at people, you can say linesman referee, very, very rarely um, are there characters you look at and say, yeah, he'd make a great referee, you know, uh, you know, six foot seven, uh, you know, uh, type, you know, so referees tend to be a little smaller, a little faster, a little, little prettier skaters where, you know, the linesmen are, are not afraid to get hit by pucks and players and get in between people. Um, so that's the route I took in the minor leagues as, as a linesman. Of course, we did all the roles growing up uh, and through the ranks. And um, some of my favorite games to do before I got into semi-professional were like the, the junior ranks. Uh, you know, so it's beyond high school, it's 20 and under. And we're pretty close to Canada. So, you know, some Canadian, we see some Canadian teams. Uh, I remember doing a game. So one thing about officiating and, and doing all these types of games is like if you're in the NHL, you know your rule book, it's one rule book. If you're a minor official who's working a day job and, and doing this, you're doing all like four or five leagues. So your weight in your referee bag is rule books. So you have a USA Hockey rule book. You have a USA Hockey Juniors rule book. You have a uh, National Federation of Ice Hockey or High School Hockey rule book. You have an, an American Hockey League rule book. You have a... East Coast Hockey League, and everything has intrinsically little, small little differences. You have to remember them. And I remember a friend of mine, we called him Hannerhan because he loved slap shot. And that, he, he kind of self-named him that, himself that. And he, he was assigning some games up north of Syracuse where there was a good Canadian a, uh, junior A-League that was had Syracuse in the loop. And he's like, hey, Jim, I need, the, need you to ref, can you come on and ref a junior A game? I'm like, cool, yeah, I'm there, you know. And I was like, I, I just need a copy of the rule book. And he goes, oh, Canadian Junior A, it's pretty simple. And he told me a few things. And I'm like, you just, you know, check from behind is this. And, you know, five-minute high stick is an automatic game, whatever. And he's like, yeah, I'll meet you at the exit. I'll give you the rule book. I pull off the exit at McDonald's. Nowhere to be found. Half hour goes by. It's like, I got to get to the game. So we go to the game. I brought a linesman up with me. And we met the other linesman there. And um, I get on the ice. And it was a pretty rough game right from the start. And uh, one thing this guy told me, he said, a check from behind, even a minor check from behind is an automatic game disqualification. So, but you know, things go a little rough. First play of the game, check from behind. It wasn't, wasn't an injury potential where it deserved a five minute major. You know, when you're an official, your arm just goes up, like, shit. Um, and like you blow the whistle and you got a check from behind. You're like, is this boarding? No, it's not even close to boarding. Is it rough? No, it's a check from behind. So you call it and like, all right, I got to kick this kid out of the game, I think. And before you know it, he's going right to the dressing room. And I'm like, thank God. <laughs> it was a <laughs> conduct and he, and he was gone and he knew it. So um, that helped me out. That was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, so, um, you know, starting uh, in the East Coast League, that was, that was a fun time for sure. I'm curious, uh, you know, you talk a little bit about kind of transitioning from being a player to that focusing more on officiating. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, with experience as a player, I feel like whether you're a goal scorer, whether you're a setup guy or more of a defensive player, you always have sort of uh, this, this goal of making a difference in the game, right? I mean, no matter what player you are on the ice, you want to make a difference for the better in the game you're playing. 
for me, just imagining if I were to transition from a player role to officiating, I feel like I would have a hard time trying to like kind of stay, stay back a little bit from the game and, and not, not have such a, a, a role in changing the game, you know, and just kind of watching it. Was that ever hard for you stepping away from that role? Well, the, the last part you mentioned is, is kind of the maturity factor in officiating. When, when you start officiating, you're still playing. You're, you still have the emotions, un, unbridled emotions. You know, a coach says, that was a fucking terrible call. You turn around and say, fuck you, you know, whatever. Right, right. <laughs> and, and, it, and it just escalates. And then as you learn, I remember a friend of mine, he was a local official, never did anything more than that. Um, skinny guy, didn't skate very well. He was never a hockey player, but just did officiating. And he had a great way with the coaches. Coaches are screaming at him because he probably blew the call or whatever. And he'd come over and this coach is screaming and he would just start talking very softly to him. It's like, you know, what I called there was, you know, and, and before you know it, the coach is kissing his ear and they're whispering. And it's like, <laughs> he really diffuses. <laughs> so you'd learn techniques like that from guys. Um, and the other thing too is, you know, even as a player, you can have a great conversation with the referee, tell him how terrible the call is. If you're whispering out of the side of your mouth and you're not staring at him with your hands in the air, he'll, he'll let that happen. He'll, he'll communicate with you. But when you turn around and you got your hands in there, that's a terrible call. Everyone's looking in the building and seeing everything you're doing. You know, that's, that's a free trip to the penalty box right there. Right. Um, so as a, as you mature as an official, you start out, like I said, just that organically argumentative right back. Sometimes, you know, the rules maybe a little better than they do. You, you know, you went to a couple seminars as a local official. Um, yeah. So it, it's a maturity process for sure. Um, and then with the end goal is being, you don't want to be noticed. Right. You can sneak out of a building and nobody knew you were there. That that's, that's a great game. Um, we, uh, we used to do a lot of women's college hockey when that started up. Um, when I say started up because it, you know, grew, grew from the start. Uh, where you had good women athletes who were softball players, uh, let's say volleyball players, soccer, starting to play hockey. And they just jump in at age like 16 and start playing hockey. And, you know, they figured out. And so in that first phase of women's hockey, um, these athletic women started playing the game, but they didn't have the early skating skills. So they, they were kind of choppy and, you know, but at that time, any women who played hockey for a year or two, you can get a spot on a college team right away because the teams were growing with was a title nine or whatever. They had to yep. spend as much on each program. So a lot of young girls went right into college hockey. Um, fast forward 10 years after that, I used to do like division one women's college hockey. So you have Cornell and Northeastern. You're walking up on the rink and you see these, these women warming up. They look like triple A Bantams. You know, they skate like they've been skating forever, strong strides and everything else, smaller. But then all of a sudden you see the ponytails coming out and, okay, this is women's hockey. And that is some of the best hockey you'll ever see. Um, you guys played men's league, I imagine, or maybe do now or have in the past, where if it's a no-check men's league and women's hockey is, is non-checking, this guy bumps you and everyone gets bent out of shape just because it's just natural body contact. And, you know, all this testosterone starts flowing. Women's hockey, there's so much physical contact. It's not deliberate checking. It's body position and things like that. They're so fun to watch how they play the puck and protect the puck. And there's body contact, but it's not, you know, it's not the knock them off the puck with a their head down kind of check. And I think it's impressive how like the game right there, how smart they have to be with the way they position themselves, because you can't run someone over, but you do. I mean, you want to obstruct someone from getting to the right. puck. So using your body, using the angle, it's just so it's so mental. It's just so impressive. Yeah. And like I said, women's hockey's grown. It, it's such a great sport. And, and to watch that. So what I was getting at, and hopefully none of my former supervisors were listening from college hockey, but women's hockey was so good. You really didn't have to call many penalties, you know, certainly you didn't have the unsportsman like most of the time they smelled good. They're pretty, they had their makeup on. They're real sweet girls, women, and uh, the games would fly by. So when we started doing these games, you know, all the officials talked, we had each other's numbers. And so we just do a game and we'll call up our buddy who just did a women's game. What'd you have a uh, minute 50 or one, one minute, 54 seconds, 148. I got you beat. 
So we, we were like running a stop clock on these games, not purposely, but they write it on the game sheet how long it took. And so some of these games are hour and 40 minutes, three periods of hockey. Wow. Problems, big paycheck. It was great. Um, you know, and I, and I do miss, miss women's hockey, miss hockey in general, but um, I love just picking up a, uh, the, the remote and catching a, a women's game, whether it's national or, uh, competition or, or college. Um, so yeah, that, that's where I was going with the, uh, say about the uh, time in the games, you know, a fast game, uh, fast games, a happy game. We used to say, uh, you, know, you get out of there. A um, couple other things we used to say it's you as an official, you never are rooting for a team. Obviously it kind of ruins you as a fan. As a kid, I was a Bruin fan, loved Bobby Orr. Um, grew up with the Rangers here, kind of follow the Rangers. But as soon as I, I started working affiliated hockey, minor league hockey, where, you know, the farm systems, things like that, you know, you, you become less of a fan, you kind of lose the fan and you become more, uh, more objective and you see things and it kind of ruins you for quite a few years. Um, in that respect, I remember I met my wife about the time when I was doing a lot of uh, officiating and her dad's like, Oh, he's a hockey guy and decided to buy me like these team stuff. And I'm like, uh, I'm reffing their games tomorrow night, you know, like at least a minor league version of them. And it's like, you know, I, I really can't wear that. I don't think so. You know, Right. So now, uh, now I was telling uh, Zach Jones, which uh, people in Virginia and people in New York are starting to know who he is. I was telling him this morning, we were texting back and forth. Uh, I said, now I got to be a hockey fan and I got to be a Ranger fan. Come on. <laughs> Not making it easy for you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there was a, another kid that I got into hockey when he's like five, five years old. Uh, Jerry D'Amigo, you just had him on uh, recently. Yep. And uh, he was uh, talking about how he got started in hockey and he's given this interview in Finnish in German and, you know, NHL. Uh, so how'd you get into hockey, Jerry? Coming from a Binghamton, New York, not known as a hockey town. And, and he would always say this, this referee who lived upstairs. So that was me. My wife and I were preparing to get married and you start to merge your possessions and everything else. So I, I got an apartment um, that his parents were the landlord. They lived downstairs and they had two young kids. Uh, one of which was Jerry. And uh, I was doing a lot of games. I was going in and out the, the building with my gear to referee. Um, sometimes he'd see me with a stick and he's kind of an inquisitive kid. What, what do you got there? What, do you, what are you doing with that? You know, I'm like very interested, you know, and, and I was always had fun with the kids and play a little ball in the backyard or whatever. And uh, I said, it's hockey. And so finally one day I, I cut a hockey stick in half for him. I think I cut it or I bought him one. And uh, I said, Jerry, here's a stick. I took a stick out and we were playing around with a little ball. So their parking lot or their driveway went into their backyard because they had a couple apartments upstairs and it was kind of a parking lot. So it was paved. And so we'd play out there and I got some chalk and drew some, drew some lines on the ground and we set up the recycling bins on each end and I, I'd play with them. And he was a kid that you couldn't turn them off. Like you have a niece or a nephew or a kid, you just get them riled up and they're sweating. <laughs> They're all red, ready to go. And you're like, ah, go. no, you just can't leave them like that. And that was Jerry. And you know, I'd get him so worked up. I remember, you know, I'd, I'd put one hand behind my back. I'd take my left hand and my stick and I'd stick handle around him and score. And I'm like, I'm winning. You know, I'm the big dog. You're the little dog. And he'd get all pissy and moany. And so here I'm a newlywed uh, with my wife, my beautiful wife. And I, uh, knock on the door. Can Jim come out? Can Jim come out? So he <laughs> me all the time. And I became good friends with his dad. And he's like, I'm a baseball football guy. And his dad, Pete was a good athlete and, and you know, still very athletic. He goes, my kid's going to play ball and all this. I'm like, that's all right. Yeah, that's cool. But he kept playing in the backyard with me and he just loved it. He's like, dad, dad, I want to play hockey. I want to play hockey. He's dead. Dad was, dad's was very good with his money. Let's just say, and didn't want to spend, spend too much. He, he found out how much hockey was. He's no, no. And finally he begged him and he let Jerry play. And I agreed. Uh, I got my niece to play the same time. She was a couple of years older than him. And we signed him up together and I helped him as, you know, first practices and skates and things like that. And um, the kid was incredible. He would just get from one end of the ice to the other without skating. He would fall and get up, fall and get up. And that was the motion, how he got down the ice. And he would just put pucks in the net. He was just that kind of character and um for years after i after we bought our house and moved out um 
we see that we see them at the grocery store or whatever and she's they're, they're like hey jim linda how you doing thanks a lot you know we spend a lot of money every weekend this weekend we spent like six seven hundred dollars for this tournament and just busting my chops and I'm going, <laughs> thanks a lot my kids moving away from home at like age 14 to go play yeah, a yeah. development program so, so I, honestly their, their sarcasm turned into you know really true thank you for introducing yeah. the board and and uh all I did was set a little fire with him and introduce it to him. And, and he did all the rest. And he always pays me some respect in interviews, which, which is great. As he got a little older, I uh, had him come skate with my team. I remember when he was playing for team USA, um, he came home on a break and came out with my players. Uh, it, it was great. And a lot of the guys still remember him when he got called up, they saw it online. They're texting me, Jerry got called up, you know, so he had a pretty big following. They didn't even know about, um, so yeah, that was about the time I was uh, doing a lot of games in the AHL. I think I was weaning off the coast league because the, the the cities were pretty far away from me. And I'd walk in the back door with my gear and I'd bring him and his dad with me all the time. And they just find their way to find an empty seat. And uh, and then before I, I was kind of a little hero, maybe I'm maybe I got a big head about it. I was kind of his little hero for a little while until he met Chris and Peter Ferraro who played for the Rangers at the time and forget it. I, I, I was forgotten about. <laughs> but you were the one yeah. that started it all and that's what counts, right? Yeah. I'll take some credit for it. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. It's always cool. When, I mean, everybody we have on the podcast, our first question we always ask him is how, how'd you get into hockey initially? And uh, I remember Jerry talking about it and I, I thought that was such a unique story. Just, you know, uh, that a, a neighbor or basically a, a, you know, upstairs neighbor referee got him into it. And I mean, we had lots, lots of other stuff to talk about with Jerry. So we weren't able to really get super in depth to that story, but it did strike me. I was like, that's such an interesting uh, way to get into the game, but it was really cool hearing your side of the story there too, and getting some more detail on that. Yeah. I mean, his, his success is all him. And like I said, I just lit a little fire and, and it still gives me gratitude, which is pretty cool. Um, I remember watching that, the, the you know, the 24 seven series on HBO when he, the, the whole call up story. Um, I can remember being at work and uh, his aunt calling me up and saying, Hey, Jim, uh, Pete and Gina are on their way to Toronto. I just want you to know that Jerry got the call and here I'm at work, you know, doing engineering stuff. And I get some of these, this man sweat along my eye and I'm like, Oh my God, <laughs> you know, that's so cool. Certain things guys cry about. And that's probably, you know, a big one there you know well turn. yeah it's a huge deal and you know I, i'm sure it meant a ton to him but yeah it's it's all about you know where you come from and how you got into the game so it means a lot to the people involved as well sure for sure so what was you know you you talk about refing in the in the coast and in the a what was the difference between the two and which one did you prefer so i got the i had the opportunity to work in the coast league united hockey league which we called the u-haul league Everyone seemed like they're pulling around a U-Haul because they're going to get traded the next day. <laughs> and then the American League. And then I got a little, a little sniff of the NHL through some preseason uh, rookie camps and things like that. The biggest noticeable thing is the higher up you, you went, the easier your job got. So as a linesman, I'm speaking. Um, because, you know, as a linesman or officiating, I say in a two-man system, trying to move around the ice based upon what's going to happen next. So a pass comes from the D zone. To, got, to a guy out you know, in the neutral zone, pinned up on the board, you think it's going to go to him. And, and there's another guy cutting over, and you think it's going to go to him. So in the lower levels of hockey, that pass never makes it or gets deflected, so you catch yourself out of position. So as you get you know up in talent level, these passes, which are a lot more complicated than I explained, um, happen. You can actually say this pass is going to go, and you got to get down the ice. And so in that respect, it was, it was a lot easier. And, uh, and so a little less fighting as you get up a little in the higher ranks, a little less crap you have to do. Players seem to be a little more professional or a lot more professional, um, you know, because something's on the line here. You're, if you're in the A and you're, uh, you're chirping an official uh, on, on an offside call to the extent everyone sees it, and you might even get a penalty from the, the ref, um, it's not going to look good to the brass upstairs when we're looking to pull up a disciplined player. However, in, in the, some of the lower leagues, like the United league, they would talk trash with you. Like you're like on the other team, like, dude, I'm helping you out here. You help know? me help you. <laughs> yeah. You know? 
So yeah, and, and for our role as linesmen, we had a we had a pretty good relationship with a lot of the guys, especially the guys you end up rolling around on the ground with. Um, so, you know, they respect you. They'll they'll talk to you, and which was always helpful. A lot of times they'll say, "Hey, uh, I'm going to go with uh, seven as soon as the game starts. We got a little thing. We're going to get it over with." I'm like, "All right, thanks for the heads up." Or or a trainer, guys filling water bottles. Hey, hey Jimmy, uh, so I'm going to start the game with uh, a different line. And uh, these, these guys are going to go. I'm like, oh, okay. It's like, I was never a big fan of the, the WWF matchups of, of tough guys. I was more of a fan of the organic fight that breaks out, standing up for a player or goalie or something like that. But, um, you know, there was that communication that happened. And, and I, uh, you know, I can finally remember a lot of the guys, some of them, you know, aren't around today because of you know, head injuries and, and just the, the abuse of the body and the psyche on, uh, that was when you had to fight all the time too. What so, was it like trying to like, I mean, you know, obviously as a linesman, you're the one who's going in there to separate two guys whose sole goal at that moment is to drive their fist into the other guy's face. How do you sort of learn when the right time to get involved is as opposed to letting them, you know, swing away and get it out of their system? So I mentioned Kevin Collins. So I come from his school of officiating, whether I officially graduated or not. Um, he would always say that if you have a chance to get between two players that, that are going to drop the gloves, and he's always talking more about talented players, or he says, if you have a chance and they're not fighting, they're going to stand around and, and, you know, do this dance, get in there, use your wingspan, get them apart. And that, that was my philosophy. Um, a lot of times I'm like, guys, drop the gloves. You better go or we're coming in. First fight I ever broke up in pro hockey was, in, I think, in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And I think they were playing Richmond. I remember this because something unique per- happened. Uh, so my part, my linesman partner and I, there was, there was a fight on the faceoff. And these guys square up and they're dancing. Here I run in there like Superman, throw out my big wingspan, get them apart. And my partner's like shaking his head like, no, I'm not, I'm not helping. We're not going in there. And I'm like, dude, I'm already in here. So finally I had to do this awkward thing like, okay. <laughs> First punch. I hear the guy's mandible, mandible is that what it is? You know, basically the facial yeah. break. And I can never forget that sound. Ugh. He took one right and went right down and the noise it made and I'm taking him to the box. He's like, I gotta go off, I gotta go off. And yeah, he, he basically got his face broke. Jesus. As he was going off, he goes, I should I should have I should have stopped when you came in. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the first fight I ever broke up and uh Another one too. There's a guy named Brandon Christian, um, recently passed away. You know, one of these guys who went and played in that, like after he retired, played in that all fighting league in Quebec. Just, just a total cement head as far as you know the talent goes. But he would fight like crazy, and he was in Johnstown. And I got I, he went down, fought the guy, and I get on top of him, and I end up kind of inverted on him, like over his back, like this, and I had him. And he wasn't done and he stood up. And so my legs are in the air like this, in <laughs> slow motion. And then he took the World Wrestling Federation and we both go back and my partner who's a referee, he's like, showers, you're done, you know, for throwing me around basically. But I held on. Right. <laughs> Take down. But uh, he became like one of the, you know, more notorious minor league guys. And I think uh, he, uh, yeah, he, he was recently in the news that, you know, he had passed away and, and guys like him and Wade Belock, I broke him up a bunch of times. And and there was a guy who didn't look happy to fight, although he was very good at it. You know, he took a lot of abuse on the ice. I think uh, you're the big guy. You're you're six foot fifteen or whatever he was. Um, he'd get the albino uh, chirp once in a while because he had such a light complexion. Um, yeah. So yeah. So when to get, when to get in there, when not to, it's, it's something that you have to get a feel for. If it's, if it's a player who's talented and maybe he just has to show his, that he's standing up and he really knows he's not going to fight his stick still in his hands. Is, it's up here. Um, and the other guys that you're more of a combative guy, you break it up and everyone's happy. Um, obviously when they do drop and they go, um, especially in the upper levels, they'll let you know when they're done and they'll actually stop when they're done. I had situations where 
remember uh, Binghamton Rangers were playing. There was a guy named Sylvain Bluon. Uh, he, he was a big, he played in New York. He was a, he had a big right hand or, and I remember him squaring up with some guy. They're tied up and they're holding on. They're not fighting. And he's saying with his broken French accent to the other player, he's like, my hand, you know, it's broken. I cannot play, you know? Uh, and the guy's like, okay, cool. He backs up. And what does he do? He sucker punches <laughs> with the same hand. But but apparently his hand, he had some surgery or something. He wasn't supposed to fight, but it's like, come on, guys. <laughs> right. But yeah, you, you, you kind of learn uh, when and when not to go in. And a lot of times you can learn and look at when the guy flips you over, you probably didn't need to jump in there quite yet, or you, you take one to the chin or what have you. Are you aware, like, you know, the, you know, sort of the nickname for some of the minor leagues and, the, and even the coast is the jungle. And because there's a ton of animals in the jungle and they can hurt you in a lot of ways. Are you aware when the, when the heavyweights or the big boys are on the ice, is that something that you're conscious of, or is it something where oh, yeah. you can catch it out of the corner of your eye, you turn around and, you know, Brian McGratton's got someone up against the glass. Yeah. I mean, you know, the personalities, or if you don't, someone in, in the officiating room, when you're getting ready, we'll go over the lineups and say, Oh shit, we got, we got him and we got him. You got to watch these guys and your, your eyes on them. You know, you're not, you're not calling penalties unnecessarily on them or anything like that, but, just be aware when play stops, where are they and what are they going to do? So as an official, there's three P's, uh, people, puck, position. Um, so basically, whistle blows. All right, where is everybody? Where, where, where's uh, Mr. Crazy Guy? And then most importantly to an official who's got to drop the next faceoff, um, where's the puck? And, and then where's the faceoff going to be? Is it inside, outside? You know, where were we? So you get a scrum and you're picking up equipment. And you got a garage sale on the ice. You're like, then like, shit, wh where's the face off? Let alone, where's the puck? You know, it's like, you don't want to go get another puck. And all of a sudden there's a, another puck on the ice somewhere. Um, so, so yeah, you get a little distracted with that for sure. Um, so I'm sorry, I got off track there. Your original question. Are was, you good? It was just like, I mean, are you aware, like when those guys yeah. are on the ice each shift? Cause I know that can happen in the blink of an eye. So, yeah. um, yeah. is it just, you know, like even as a, even as a kid watching, you know, broom duster and Binghamton Whaler and Binghamton Ranger hockey, you know, I, I remember I take people to the games and I'll, I'll say those two are going to go, they're going to drop the gloves. Why? How do you know that? I'm like, I just know. And so I, I kind of had that as a hockey fan and many hockey fans will see that you see that the matchups like, why is he on the ice? You know, they're, you know, it's a tie gate or whatever. And so you, you kind of learn that behavior. Um, I can remember doing a game. I think I was in Tallahassee, Florida. And they had, uh, it sent us down there for, um, sent me down there for a week to do like four games. And they would play uh, two games against the same team and then two games against another. So there's this guy, I think his name was Bedard on Birmingham. Uh, and he was, pretty grizzly looking and you know he had a reputation and I think I saw him the first game and I'm okay I'm gonna keep my eye on him and he's just trying to get somebody to go with him trying to sucker punch somebody I'm following him around the ice you know short of holding his shirt tail and the coach is like why are you bothering my player why are you following him around it was the guy's name was Phil Roberto he was a famous NHL player I didn't know him from Adam and he's giving me shit he's dropping the f-bombs at me and just continually berating me. And I remember turning around and saying, fuck off. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. I don't, I don't swear a lot. I mean, I, you know, I, I'll, I just turned it on when it needs to be. And I'm like, okay. And then after that, he's like, I'm calling the league. You're getting fired. And I'm like, shit. Finally, my, uh, my referee partner, who was a little more senior than I, he, he pulled him over the side, did that whisper thing in his ear and, and, and and I want to have said, Hey, sorry, I got a little hot with you coach. I said, I, you know, I'm just trying to do my job. And, but you know, th those types of things. And that was an instance where I was kind of trailing the guy. I, I knew who he was. And, um, it's funny. Yeah. You build up relationships with some of these guys, like I said, um, cause you might save their ass some night, um, you know, in some respects. Um, one, one guy that I got to know pretty well is Trevor Sen. Um, do you know who Trevor Sen is? I know the name. So yeah. if you Google Trevor Sen, you'll see a video that'll pop up and it'll be him and Steve Tasker who played for uh, um, what's uh, Toledo. Um, and it's, they're two middle-sized guys. They're not 
not big, um, maybe, maybe big arms and everything else, but two smaller guys compared to the average hockey player. And center was, was a tough guy. He, he had talent, but he was tough as nails and he'd fight anybody. And this other guy was very similar. So there's a, a video of them just trading punches to each other's faces for like two minutes. It, so this, these are the, so that's, that's Trevor Sen, toughest guy, you know, pound for pound. I think I've ever seen, I don't think he ever made it to the NHL. Um, I've seen him in the A. I've seen him in the UHL. Well, so a quick story. My best friend is, was a trainer for the Richmond Renegades. Uh, he was from Binghamton. I knew him. A lot of guys came through, left the Binghamton Rangers. They were like stick boys and they graduated to equipment boys and equipment managers. And a lot of these guys, this was like a hockey hotbed for um, equipment trainers around the whole, all the leagues. And there's still some out there. So um, he was with my buddy who was a trainer for the Richmond team and, and son was on Richmond and I'd see him a lot. And so we spent a little time together on and off the ice, uh, whether we were allowed to or not. And uh, I remember he was playing in the, maybe the United League in Binghamton. And um, I hadn't seen my friend who was in Virginia still for quite some time. And so center's just beating the crap out of this guy. He just, his, his hamburger knuckles are just eating this guy up. And, you know, I'm huffing and puffing, pulling apart. I get him across and get him over against the board just to calm him down. And he's like, he's like, hey, you talk to Jonesy? Jonesy's <laughs> No, and he's like, he's having this conversation. He's really in love. And I'm like, oh, Trevor, just get in the box. We'll, we'll chat later. <laughs> you know, but, you know, these guys, it's not all about fighting. It's, it's about, uh, you know, they don't get angry. The good guys who are the tough guys don't typically get angry. It's just, you know, that's their job. And it's an athletic feat for them, whether you agree or disagree. Um, I've broken, I remember breaking these guys up uh, two or three times. Uh, these two players, I can't even think of names right now. Um, tired out by the end of the game. I think they had, I think they got a disqualification for the third fight or something. Um, I had a rough time with them. I'm walking out of the arena with my bag and the bus is out there. And there they out there. there the two of those guys are out there talking. Like, yeah, yes. We'll see you this summer. We'll have to do some fishing. You know, it's like, dude, you guys just gave me, you know, a pretty long night. And here you are, uh, you know, kissing each other goodbye. But there, there was a lot of that. And, you know, you probably heard of uh, uh, Nasty Morasty. Yep. Uh, and uh, his cousin there. Um, can't even think of his name right now. But, yeah, they, they would fight on the ice, and they were in each other's weddings and stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's crazy to think, um, you know, about that. But it, it's just kind of part of the game. I think when every fight I ever got in, I was angry. And I blacked out, and I lost my temper, and I, you know, ended up in the box or whatever. And. Yeah, for sure. It's yeah. funny you say that, like, you know, the guys are wailing on each other one minute and then they're, you know, they're going out for beers the next We uh, Earlier on, we had uh, we had Rob Ray come on and he would talk about, you know, he's like, I fought Ty Domi like 14 times. And then like they had like an anniversary of like their like last fight together where they like went to the arena and lowered the Jumbotron and like sat on a couch together and watched it. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely a like sort think, of like a fraternity. I think I broke, them. broke up Rob Ray once. I think he was down in Binghamton maybe or. Rochester, I remember him because I remember he had a greasy body because all his <laughs> off in one swipe and talk about trying to hold, get a hold of somebody who's, you know, obviously very good at what he's doing. It's like no leverage whatsoever, uh, you know, and of course he, he was kind of legendary already by that time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was a he was a he was a great guest, and just the the fact yeah, that every that. every fight he was in was you know just equipment is going everywhere, like you know the the tarps coming off, and he's just shirtless running around with the mullet in the '90s, which is priceless. And then there were some guys that modified their equipment. I mean, he was obviously one of them. Um, uh, there was a guy named Ryan Vanderbush, played for the Rain, New York Rangers. He had you know how when you get in a scrap or something, the ear loops on the helmets they come off, and your helmet rips off pretty easily. Well, he had these leather ear loops and he had the helmet buckled so tight. You weren't getting that thing off him. And, and he was pretty tough. I mean, there was nothing uh, wimpy about the guy, but he liked to keep his helmet on. Uh, and that, that was, uh, that was always, he was always uh, a challenge for anybody who took on. Probably the toughest guy in the minor leagues that I ever dealt with um, was Serge Robert. Pretty legendary. There was two brothers. They were uh, French Canadians, obviously. Um, Mario and Serge Roberge, they were like the Bash brothers. And uh, 
Uh, Serge kept playing, and I think he played in just about every league that I officiated over the years. And the guy's six foot, maybe 190 pounds, but pound probably the strongest guy I've ever, ever dealt with. I remember holding on to his arm as he's wailing on somebody, and I'm like going with him. I'm like, you know, here I am. At the time, I was probably or 225. You know, I'm just over maybe close to six one, and here he is. I'm like a jackhammer. I'm like, and, and the funny part is, I took French in high school only because I, I wanted to talk to hockey players. So I, by the time I'm in my twenties, I knew very little, you know, just like, arrête, arrête. like stop. You know? <laughs> or I would joke around, I would talk to players, I French Canadian and puck would be laying there and I'd be skating by and I go, EC, EC, you know, basically here, give me the puck. Yeah. And all of a sudden the guys would come over to me and start like, whatever. I'm like, dude, no. It's like, that's, that's the extent <laughs> that's the of the only my thing I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I, I remember the kids in the textbooks. There you go. You had to say uh Catherine Lardon, Abita Montreal, and like every carriage. I still remember those those folks from the textbooks. So it's, it was about the if, unless I needed to talk about somebody in the book, I was pretty bad. We uh we won't keep you for too much longer. I, I one thing I want to know, uh you talked a little bit earlier about um just kind of you know the the different sort of rewarding aspects of officiating and i'm curious what uh over the course of your career as an official was the most rewarding element of it to you i mean obviously a lot of times when we have uh you know forwards on the show they talk about some big goals they've scored or goalies we have on they talk about a big big shutout or a big save but for officiating i'm curious is it just you know, you mentioned earlier getting paid to just get exercise and be on the ice. I mean, that's got to be awesome. Or just to see such a high level of hockey right in front of you. What are, what are kind of the main things that make you love it so much? Yeah, well, it's kind of a two-part question. So, like, some of the more momentous occasions are maybe buildings I've worked in. And, you know, you know, I had a chance to do some, some like, Islanders, Rangers training camps, you know, things like that just by getting a phone call, Hey, you know, we know you can, would you come do the game? And, um, you know, they weren't official, uh, NHL regular season games or anything like that. Um, that was, that was pretty cool. Um, working in, uh, some of the bigger buildings, the NHL buildings, remember the first, uh, sellout in the Philadelphia spectrum I did. Um, so the Phantoms started playing there right after they built the new arena. Um, so the Phantoms moved into the old spectrum, the Flyers played in the, I don't know what they call it this week. It was the core states or something at the time. And so I'm, I'm doing it. I have a home and home with Hershey and Philly. And my friend who works for the Binghamton Rangers called me up. He said, Hey, we're, we're headed down to Philly. Can you get us some tickets to the game? And I'm like, you can't get tickets. He goes, it's sold out. They don't even have any cops anymore. I'm like, really? And he goes, yeah, it's a big game. I'm like, I looked at my schedule. I go, Oh, that's pretty cool. We're going to have a sellout at the spectrum. So I think I, we hooked them up with tickets or whatever. And, we uh, go to the game. It's a big TV game. And that was, I think the first sellout they had there. And, and that's where that rivalry kind of started with, with Hershey and Philly, uh, you know, and that was uh, who was Frank by uh, uh, Wade Belock, trying to think that some of the heavyweights, Jeff Staples, it went on and on. And so that, that was a pretty awesome crowd to do a game in front of because it was very electric. Um, I can remember that game. I think it was like maybe five minutes in. You had a pretty good line brawl and everyone was throwing and we, we got it all under control. And I'm like, shit, I must have been so amped for this game. I didn't even put my, my elbow pads on. So I think I was felt pretty banged up from going to the ice with these guys. And I, I was so psyched for the game. I didn't even completely get dressed. Um, but I can remember that game going to OT. And when the, when the buzzer rang to start the, start of overtime they, they would play a lot of rocky clips in philly so in philly they like their cheese steaks they like rocky and they like fighting so i remember playing on the big screen it's like uh, rocky's wife win rocky win and mickey the trainer go get him and the crowd just goes crazy and they're playing eye of the tiger and i don't think i've ever been in a i think i've been in front of more fans but not so loud and i felt myself kind of getting lifted off the ice i was so pumped um, so that was certainly a great place to work. Um, another great place is where I work every day of the week is Cornell University. Um, I'm a facilities engineer. I'm a civil engineer for the university. Um, but before I worked there, I was doing a lot of games there. And that's 
on the East Coast. Uh, Got to be one of the more memorable rinks to play, officiate, or attend games, and the fans are crazy. And I know we got these bigger arenas now, with like Penn State, and uh, you know, but at the time, I guess Michigan, uh, the, the big house, uh, not the big house, but the, the rink in Michigan and Cornell were like known as the best places to play because the bands are never ending; they're loud, they don't stop. The student section, you know. And I still take my, my family to games now. Uh, I remember taking my wife up to me. I was doing the Cornell Harvard game. And that's one where like a week in advance, people, fellow officials are calling you from Boston. Hey, uh, I got a friend who's looking for tickets to the game. It's sold out. And I'm like, oh, my, my family's gone, you know? So I remember my wife being like pregnant with one of our kids and had another kid in tow. And we didn't know what to expect, right? And I didn't know what to expect on the ice and she didn't realize how crowded it was going, was going to be because they're all bench seats and you're right on top of each other in, in, this, in most sections. Um, but I remember we go out on the ice and my, my partner's like, all right, um, they're going to throw fish. I'm like, yeah, I heard something about a fish, like the squid in Detroit or whatever. And he goes, they're going to throw a lot of fish. Um, so after they announce the Harvard team, you need to get right up against the glass. I'm like, okay, I'll do whatever you say. And, and, they announce the team. And so, you know, they hold the newspapers up when they're reading the other team and like, they're not paying attention. Uh, and then they throw them up and they throw them on the ice. At the same time, they throw the fish on the ice uh, and not just a squid. There's squids. There's halibut. There's cod. There's Swedish fish. There's goldfish crack. Just throw tons of anything with fish and it's disgusting and it smells for a period and a half. And that, that goes back to the tradition when Cornell, which was started as an agricultural school, would play up to Harvard, and the Harvard fans would throw dead chickens on the ice. So, so they just went to like the local Dallas fish market, Harvard. And, they, and they were like, "Whatever you have that's fish shaped or fish yeah. related, give it to me. I'm going to throw it on the ice." And, I, and I've been to those games after you know when I wasn't officiating, and, and they're checking people. You know, people have these big pieces of fish in their shorts or in their pants or whatever. It's it's nuts. Um, so. Those are some of the two memorable places to work. And again, uh, you know, certainly doing some pretty good playoff games were always fun. Uh, but, but for me, as I kind of go into the twilight of my officiating career, you know, you're doing games every night of the week, it seems like. And so you do your pro and college games on the weekends. You have a day job. See, I wasn't the longest tenured official. I wasn't the best. I'm just one of those guys who you saw that, you know, came into the rink and left and did my job. Um, but meanwhile, I had to go to work the next day or, or do things like that. Um, so, you know, that was, that was always a challenge, but uh, it's funny, quick little story. Um, so when I was in, when the Binghamton Rangers were here, um, there were a lot of players that would stay around in the summertime. And, and my friend was the, uh, one of the trainers for the Rangers, uh, equipment trainers. And he's like, hey, you want to skate with us this weekend? You know, so we got to get some ice and say, oh, I'll, I'll rent the ice. So I rent the ice, pay 200 bucks for the session or whatever it was at the time. And, and all these players would show up and, and we'd skate. And you'd feel like you're ready to play in the NHL playing with these guys because you skate with them, you, you move the puck with them. And, you know, some of these guys were NHLers and former NHLers. And it was, it was a lot of fun. But at the end of the night, they're just leaving. And you're like, uh, excuse me, um, it's $200 for the ice. These guys aren't used to <laughs> And so like my buddy would get money later from, you know, but these guys didn't know they're just, you know, the professionals that thought the ice is given to them. And uh, one friend of mine, he was, he was a French Canadian. And he was, uh, he had a big contract with the Rangers and it was a Sunday night. I think we we're skating and he's like, do you want to go out for drinks? I'm like, no, uh, Guy, I gotta, I gotta work in the morning. Go, oh, really? Okay. Um, do, do you want to go golfing tomorrow? I just told you I have to work. Tomorrow. He goes, all right. How about how about like at one o'clock then? I'm like, I work past one o'clock. He goes, wow, all day, eight hours. He was, <laughs> he was the same family. His father won five Stanley Cups with the Canadians, and he had no grasp of what you know somebody working a day job is. And 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 that and that was kind of the same with with officiating too. You know, these a lot of the guys that did it full time. You know, they may not understand that you got there a bit late because you had to sneak out of work at noon and get down to Hampton roads for a seven o'clock game and go down 95. And it's like, those were some of the most tension I've had in my life is being 
you know, half hour from the rink and time is wasting. You're not moving in traffic. You know, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have GPS. You know, you pull up to the rink and you get a, I remember one time we grabbed the cop. We're like, um, can you park? Can you get our car parked? We're supposed to be doing the game and, you know, running late. And it, yeah, th- those were some, some fun times. Uh, I yeah I just think it's so impressive that you've you know full-time job for for so long and you've done officiating for so long I mean that just to me that's just someone who really is passionate about the game itself and who loves it so I mean hats off to you that's just so impressive but that's thousands of guys most most of the guys you see unless they have an N and H and NL on their shirt most part (laughs) for sure what's um I I was always curious about this you know whenever I bump into someone who's been an official is there like a one player that sticks out to you that you, you know, ref a game with where you're just like, this player is unbelievable. They're so skilled. Is there like one player that sticks out to you as like the most skilled that you've ever witnessed while refing a game? Um, Jason Spezza was, was pretty special. Um, you know, obviously I remember he just would walk through people and just be hanging their laundry on the net when he was done um, for sure. Um it's funny, I uh, was doing a game once in the United Hockey League, not the most illustrious league, but this guy kept picking the puck out of the air when I was dropping it. I'm like, and then, you know, he started with a fair face of sticks on the ice, and it was uh, it was Gretzky's brother. <laughs> I, I'm like, ah, oh. you know, the, the face, I'm like, you know, like, I mean, not that he makes sense. <laughs> you could see they all had a little talent there. Um, but, yeah, there was certainly a bunch who came through, uh, you know, and, and look. Actually, when I was doing uh, junior hockey, uh, Brian Gianta, he was like four foot two. I don't know. He was he was 15 years old, maybe playing with the Rochester Junior Monarchs. And, you know, of course, the rest of them were closer to 20 years old. And he's just tooling around everybody I'm like, who is this kid? And uh, that's Gianta. And, you know, before you know it, he's he grew a little bit. But, you know, he. He, uh, that much, yeah. <laughs> that, that was one for sure. Uh, another, another one that, and this is kind of get a little more personal because uh, I talk about my buddy uh, Rob Jones. He was a trainer in hockey and ended up uh, spent a lot of time in Richmond. And that's where he lives. Um, I invited his kid who was playing hockey uh, down in Virginia to play on some travel teams. Um, his grandparents lived in in our town, so I said, "Hey, I got to practice with my guys. Does Zach have his gear?" And remember, Rob brought him over. Um, got on the ice maybe a few minutes after my players did. And, uh, you know, when you, you get out on the ice, there's guys who do a serious warm up, and there's the guys who just grab the pucks and start shooting them right away. Um, you know, that was probably most of my guys, right? You know, they skate around twice and they think they're ready to start shooting around and go taking slap shots on the goalie. And so we're out there getting warmed up. And, and then Zach comes out on the ice, and Zach had to be like, I don't know, 10 years old maybe. And I had like some 15, 16 year olds, and he's stretching out. And he's skating and he looks so professional and everyone's just stop what they're doing. Like, who is this kid? Uh, and, you know, it's another Jerry Domingo thing. So those guys remember who that is. And so, uh, so the kid, you know, just won the NCAAs with UMass and uh, yep. he got the call up and, and some of the kids I coached, they're like, Hey, that's, that, that's the guy you brought to practice. You know, I'm like, yeah, they, you know, that, uh, that's pretty cool pretty special definitely so one thing about the minor leagues i I had kind of had this as a note to talk about is you uh especially like the coast league you called it the jungle we called it the cocktail league (laughs) a lot of cocktails going on and out there some of the guys i think every city i could name the bar before i can name like the main street you know like in in, uh, wheeling it was tj's and uh, Raleigh, it was the long branch, uh, in Johnstown, it was, you know, a couple different places, you know, so you, there was a lot of that going on. Um, so like I said, there was a lot of hockey trainers that came out of Binghamton. There was a few of them in the East coast league at the time when I was working, and you're not making a lot of money. Um, you know, especially as a linesman, when you've got the referee stripes, you're making a bit more money, but so you tried to live pretty cheaply. And, and when your buddy says, Oh, stop by the team dinner afterwards, or, you know, like, oh, that's probably, I shouldn't be doing that, but, you know, you go grab some food and kind of walk out and, um, yeah, inadvertently end up spending time with the teams, ending up where they're, where you're not supposed to. I think it says right in the rule book, do not fraternize with the players, do not go to their, their, their haunts. But 
like that's the only game in town you go there and that's where all the players are and that's where all the girls were and the, you know all the activity and so everybody wanted to congregate there um, and that was always fun I can remember doing a game with a guy I was pretty happily engaged I think at the time I, one thing I never did was cheat on my wife you know but I, I was pretty social and flirtatious I guess as much as anyone but my other guy was a little more single than me and uh, so we go into a place after a game and you know we got suits on or four coats and ties and my hair when I had it was you know wet and slicked back so remember these women coming over to us and they're like great game guys like wow thanks you know they walk by and my buddy is like look at her you know and I'm I'm like they think we're they they think we did a good job tonight right and I'm like wow that's pretty cool you know we don't get that all the time and then they come back and the one girl's talking to my my buddy my buddy's like six six and she goes yeah you guys played really well tonight and he he was getting (laughs) and I'm like you know I was ready to say something then a couple of players come over and start bringing us drinks it's like forget about it you know it doesn't really matter at this point yep but yeah, there you know there was a lot of fun on the road, and that's probably some of the more colorful memories. Um, and like I said, I was just one of those guys whose career was bookend to bookend. I I started it, and I stopped it on my own my own terms. But there are guys that are still doing games. Um, they're you know whether it's local or uh, you know minor pros. There's legendary guys that uh, you know have done so many big games, and and you know, my hats off to them. You know, I did it well doing another career and trying to get things going i had ran into quite a few that um so in the american league we were uh, supervised by the nhl so the nhl officiating supervisors would show up at our games um, mostly because the referees at the time were all assigned by the nhl so you guys you had guys that were doing nhl and ahl or maybe full ahl but they're getting primed to to get the, the call up to say do 40 and 40 in each league. And, and so they were supervised us as well. And, uh, you know, that, that, that was a pretty good part of it. Um, so we'd have the benefit of, of having them in the building all the time. And just a very humbleizing story uh, starts out with, uh, I was doing a series maybe in Syracuse and there was a supervisor there. His name was Will Norris, another famous NHL official in this time. And they all kind of become supervisors. And I thought I did a pretty good job. You know, I, some pretty rough night or whatever. Next day I get a call from the, the VP of the American hockey league. This guy, Gordy Anziano, great guy. And he's like, Jimmy, I, I got to tell you, uh, Willie Norris uh, called me this morning and he was at your game. I'm like, shit, what did I do? What did, you know, what, Oh my God, I'm, like, I'm not going to get any more games. And he goes, you wanted to tell me that they're, they're, they're keeping an eye on you. You know, you did a great job and he, he likes your, likes your stature or whatever. And I'm like, wow, cool. You know, I'm like, wow, getting my shot. And and at the time, I think we had two New Yorkers already make it to the NHL. We're probably not going to take any New Yorkers for another 10 years. Um, They tend to be more Canadian with the officials, unfortunately. Um, But so I I was pretty cocky. And I think a couple weeks later, I see Will Norris again and before the game. And he's like, Jimmy, let's go take a walk. I'm going to talk to you. Oh man, I'm getting made. I'm going to go to the show tomorrow night. When I've got the Bruins Canadians, what do I have? You know? And he's like, takes me for coffee. And I'm like, all right. He goes, I was watching some game tapes the other day. And I, I saw you, uh, you blow a pretty costly offside call. That could have, that could have cost a goal or something. Oh but no. From like, go like this to like, Oh really? And I, and I went, you know, then I went off to the room and, uh, wasn't too excited for that game, but, uh, yeah, so I, I had some good looks, I guess, um, but I, I never was a physical specimen. I, I was big just naturally, but I, I wasn't the guy who like worked out four hours a day in the gym and was totally cut up or, or even ate right. Um, one time I got a call from the league and they said, some guy with uh, NPR wants to do a story on officials. And he wants to, and he said, and he said, I told him I, he should follow you, upcoming officials. You and this guy who was an NHL linesman for a bunch of years already, but he came down to the A to train to be a referee. He wanted to go back and be a referee, he wanted to make the big bucks, and, you know, wear the orange armband. His name was Lyle Seitz, a great guy. Um, so he's like, I told him to follow you two around for a couple of days. And so he followed us from arena to arena. And so I got razzed pretty well. Like, oh, you're, you're, the, you're, the, you're the next one. You're the big one, you know? And I'm like, 
and these senior guys who are in my mind more experienced they certainly are more experienced than me and better than me and i'm like why why am i in this in this position but i thought it was it was, thought it was pretty cool um but uh you know it, it is what it is you know you, it's a numbers game just like anything else and like i said getting back there were guys who just worked crappy jobs you know in the off season and just tried to do full time in the during the season and and live in like the east coast lake apartment it was like a glorified frat house they, they provided apartments um not the lifestyle you want to live and you know a lot of them got in financial troubles and and at, at one point we're all probably the same skill level it's just who brings what to the table um you know maybe i was a little uh mouthy at times or whatever maybe maybe cockiness or whatever they'll they knock you down and then there's the guy who is call him a kiss ass but somebody who's who's really uh, obedient and does the right thing says the right things you know they'll get the other look and then there's a guy who who walks on the ice at camp and you know they're asking you for advice and they walk on the ice and they're six foot six and they're from greater toronto area and the next year they're in the nhl and you're like i'm not the next one you're not the next one you know so then and then we start i started doing college hockey and um, kind of did it a little more for the money at times because the money's certainly a lot better uh you know as a as a day-to-day -day official there for sure well uh jim you know we, we could sit here for four and a half hours talking to you about this kind of stuff this is you know what we eat sleep and breathe uh mac do you have any questions before we wrap up here um i think i'm all set it's been really awesome hearing all these stories like nick said i'm sure we could sit here for a while and hear lots more good ones but we'll have to have you back on sometime to uh get to some of those probably so well hey i really really had a lot of fun i guess time flew and i did i brought a beer as you directed <laughs> those skinny beers that i think one of you guys are drinking but i was afraid i was going to get in front of so i got the blue light there you go somebody had an ultra i don't know who it was that would That's be mac me. yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Figured bust my chops for that, but no, it was a lot of fun. I, I enjoy listening to you guys. Like I said, I can, I work out every morning on the bike and it's just, it's just pain and I hate it, but you know, I can listen to Pitbull or uh, workout music, you know, whether it's uh, what's his name. Uh, but I, I think my time goes faster when I listen to you guys or, uh, you know, spitting chicklets or something like that. When you guys like Rob Ray on just talking about old times, it, it's just really cool to hear the stories. Um, so I'll be, I'll be listening. So don't worry. Big thanks to Jim for that awesome interview. It was super cool to get to know him and to talk to him and just hear, you know, all about his journey to, you know, getting involved in the game and to becoming a referee and, you know, all the crazy stories he has about officiating games, whether it was a minor league game or a collegiate game. So a uh, huge thank to him. Uh, before we get into all the gambling nonsense that we all know that you guys love, we just want to take a moment to remind you that this gambling advice is always brought to you by the Maryland Mortgage Wiz. Are you planning on buying your first home this year? Get pre-approved and explore all financing options with Dave Fritz, the Mortgage Wiz. Interest rates are at a historic low and down payment assistance programs are available. Stop renting and put your money in a place that you can call home. Follow Dave on Instagram at Maryland underscore mortgage underscore whiz. For more information, Dave is licensed in Maryland, Delaware, and Florida. Equal housing lender, NMLS number 3094. Alrighty, boys, let's get into some meat and potatoes, some gambling like we like to. Uh, I had a pretty good week. How about you guys? I haven't had a good week in fucking forever, so I'm done. <laughs> I had a interesting week that yeah, you finished did. out good, luckily. <laughs> I just, I, I'm getting like just rooked lately. Like, for instance, Colorado Anaheim. The other night I published, I'm like, I like the over five and a half. Avalanche put up like four every game. The Ducks, eh, they'll probably get one, maybe two. You know, it's a little iffy. The over had hit on like every single game prior to that in, those, in the Ducks Avalanche matchup. And then I got screwed. And then, Mac, we had the Minnesota money line when they were up against the Blues, and the Blues tied it 
And then Ryan O'Reilly won it in overtime yeah. and the wild blew it. And I'm just and like, he, I, and he won it in overtime with two seconds left on like a backhand goal where the wild had literally basically like, I watched one of the players on the ice for the wild literally look up at the clock and, and like stop playing. He's like, Oh, cool. There's like five seconds left. And then he O'Reilly just went right around them and scored on the backhand. And like, like, I don't know how you can get a worse beat than that. And like two weeks ago, you know, Minnesota plays a two game series against Vegas. Minnesota wins the first one. I hammer Vegas on the second one. I'm like, Vegas has lost one. I repeat, one back-to-back series, both games all year. I'm like, for sure, dub, they lose. I went ham on that. And March Madness fucked me, so I'm not even going to get into that. But <laughs> you know what? I, I'm, I'm, I'm coming uh, back now. I'm a second-half guy. So, um, All, all right. right. Nick, you want to start it off? Uh, my UMass minus 130. I thought that was a lock over St. Cloud call. State, and I was right. Uh, yep. Just the momentum that they had after beating a two-time defending champion and the team that fucked them in the finals two years ago, um, you just felt like, even though they were missing four of their best players, you just felt like they were the team to do it, and luckily they did. Not so much a trend I like, but just a trend to be careful of. I would just say to everyone, be careful betting right after the trade deadline it's a little bit weirder this year with the way that the quarantine process is going to work um you know if your player you know whoever you're looking at is going from the united states to canada or from canada to the u.s they've got seven days so they've got about a week that they have to wait before they jump into a lineup but uh potentially this week guys are going to start playing for their new team so you never know how that's going to shake up. And especially if a team moved a goaltender and then starts them you just never really know what you're going to get so you know, take this with a grain of salt if you want to, but you usually get some curveballs right after the deadline. So just, you know, keep your wits about you. Good advice. Um, For me, and this is worth noting right now while we're recording, God knows how this will end up. uh, The Leafs are trailing the Habs two to one midway through the second. Guess who has the Leafs goal? Fucking surprise, surprise. Austin Matthews. Guess who has the assists? Surprise, surprise, Mitch Marner. It's just like clockwork. It's crazy. Um, that ties into my first point, which is ride the Jack Campbell wave. He's 11 and 0 to start his career, and he might be 11 and 1 after this, depending, but we'll see how it all shakes out. Regardless, even if the Leafs lose, I love the way they're playing. I love the chemistry that they have. They're playing for their goalie, their goalie's playing for them. So, I mean, their money lines are steep, but. You know, could be worth it if you're trying to have a desperation move. Um, One of the things that I would say is probably a better value at this point in time, and this also ties into what I just said, is that maybe instead of throwing minus 200 to minus 300 or somewhere in that range on a lease um, money line, you're probably better off starting to bet Matthew's goal props every single game because it's automatic at this point. I mean, I know minus 130 to score a goal isn't the best value and it's a little painful, but especially if they're at home because uh, he's dominant. Well, it doesn't even matter. He's first in away goals too. So I guess that doesn't really mean shit. Yeah. Just hammer him every game. He's minus minus one thirty, So who cares? It's better value than the Leafs winning uh, the wild Mac. You got on the wild train right at the right time when they were getting hot. And then I started riding it and it was, it was looking good. But lately in the last 10 games, they haven't been as hot as I would like to see them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're five, three, and two in their last ten, which doesn't sound horrible, but that's realistically five and five in money line terms. Yeah, and that's just not what we have been used to seeing. You know, maybe a month ago, it's not so, a lock by any means. Yeah, it's it's in that you know because they got hot. I don't think the value is totally there, so I would just be hesitant on betting the wild at this moment in time. And they got absolutely shit rocked the last two games against uh the blues that kind of sucks <laughs> that first game was ridiculous yeah 9-1 that was not great and um, the worst part of it was they had that was the first of back-to-backs against the blues so they couldn't really put their backup goalie in. they just had to let kakinen suffer through the nine goals because well yeah. they have to play talbot the next game so don't it doesn't really do them any good to use both their goalies in the first game it was just a mess for them man yeah, it, it really was. Um, the blue chip bet of the year, the Sens Leafs over. I've said it a thousand times. It's such a steal, too. I, yeah. I, I will say it a thousand more times. Anytime these two teams play, you bet the over. I think they only have one more game. 
They have one more game and it's the last game of the year for the Leafs. And I oh, will wow. definitely be betting that one because I feel like there's going to be some stat padding going on there. You know, well, there might about. be some uh, starters resting. Too, I was going to say to keep an eye on that, that too. And if Matt Murray is in net, it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> that's what I'll leave that at. <laughs> because if even if it's Marley sends over, it's still going to hit. <laughs> yeah, for real. it's it's nuts. Uh, my last point, and I just figured this was a good little stat, you know, since we're a little over halfway through the year. The top five puck line teams this season, when they are favorites, meaning when they're w- minus one and a half, not plus one and a half. This, the, these standings are strictly minus one and a half, and they are not based on frequency of wins, but rather based on profits. Okay. Per oddshark.com. In this order, the Jets are the best puck line team when favored in the league so far this year. Second, the Predators. Yes, I'm smiling. Three, the Islanders. Four, the Wild. And five, the Canadians. I think the Canadians are up there because they had a hell of a start to the year, but it hasn't really been smooth sailing since. And that's to win by two, right? You're saying these are the best teams to win by two. Correct. And it's based off how much money you would win if you bet like a hundred bucks on the mm-hmm. puck line every game. It's not based on how many times it's hit. Right. Um, and fun fact, the Red Wings haven't been favored in one game this year. So I figured that was worth it. Wow. That's true. That's Wild. interesting. And their puck yeah. line has hit actually a couple times. It has. It definitely has, especially against the lightning. I think like twice now, Yeah, which is crazy. Right. Well, that segues me nicely into the, Two very simple cut and dry trends I have. So cut and dry, I didn't even cut and dry. I didn't even write them down. Um, first one, if your book has adjusted puck lines, take a look at them every day. Just like take a look at them because sometimes you'll catch some random ones being in there. Like for example, when the Caps just played the Bruins for the second game in a row, they had just lost to the Bruins um, before that. And that's such a toss up game of who's going to be favored in the first place that one of them is probably going to have an adjusted puck line that is totally possible. And at a ridiculously high value, that's exactly what happened. Um, the caps had an adjusted puck line, which was literally just the caps to win by two at plus two ninety, And I and took it and that really helped me out this week. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure they won by two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they won by, I wish they, I wish I bet them to win by six goals. Cause they would have more than covered that one, but right. suck uh, on that Jack Edwards. Yeah. It was a great <laughs> Seriously. game. Um, anyway, yeah. Take a look at the adjusted puck lines. Cause sometimes with like division rivals, especially if they're not separated by a whole lot in the standings, the one team that you may not expect to be favored, isn't favored in the first place. And then the adjusted puck line is all the more valuable. So um take a look at those the other thing is um ten dollar two-way parlay oh no sorry fifteen dollar two-way parlays uh obviously it's gonna depend on what the value of each of those legs of the parlay is but um i had two different fifteen dollar two-way parlays hit for me this week um, that I felt pretty confident about. And, and the formula I followed was picking one game that I felt really confident about. Uh, and that one ended up working, but being more stressful than I thought. But anyway, uh, Predators money line, I was like, this is going to hit. And then I made two separate bets where that is a leg and then something else is a leg. Obviously that's dangerous because if the Predators lose, you lose both of them, right? But that's gambling, baby, so... <laughs> I love, I love that. It. I love that logic. <laughs> Mac, I'm so like, I feel so proud because when you came on the show, <laughs> you didn't know any of this. And you're like, what's that? Like, what's the? And now what's you're a like, puck line. Right. Now you're talking better? about legs and shit. And I'm right. like, holy hell, this kid yeah. knows what's going on. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I had an okay week. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. You, no, you did. I, I, I'm going to start following yeah. you because I'm yeah. cold as a, I don't know what's cold, but I'm cold. First liner, fourth liner. Nick, why don't you start us off? Uh, My first liner is going to be Jason Robertson of the Dallas Stars. This guy's low-key, like second in goals, or second in rookie points and fourth in rookie goals, and he was a huge 
uh, addition to my fantasy team this past week. And then my fourth liner for probably like the fourth or fifth time since we've started the show is going to be Ryan Johansson. He has four goals, nine assists in 13 points in 35 games this season. Yeah, it's rough. I, I'm pretty sure he was your fourth liner recently, and I think I made a comment like, oh, the Seth Jones trade, that was pretty lopsided. So Seriously. Um, I'll just reiterate that. Uh, for my first liner, folks, I'm excited about this name. I'm, I'm pumped. Radim Zahorna. Hey, attaboy. If you haven't heard of Radim Zahorna, that is because he has only played six NHL games in his entire career. But he is a weapon for the Pittsburgh Penguins right now. The six foot six, 230 pound Czech born forward is dominating. He has two goals and two assists in his six games played while he's on the third and fourth line, keep in mind with no power play time. And both of his goals were highlight real goals. And he looks awesome. Uh, what a great surprise for the pens right now with this kid coming up and doing his thing. And he's got a lot of sweat. Like he's kind of got that cockiness to him. Like he, he's got that Euro swag whole thing going on. He, he just doesn't give a shit. And I kind of love it. So uh, good for the pens to actually have a rookie contributing. It's not often that you see that. And then my fourth liner, uh, boy, what a fall from grace. Kevin Hayes for the Philadelphia Flyers has not looked good at all, nor have the Flyers for that matter. Uh, they just lost their second game to Buffalo uh, in the last like two weeks. I think they lost five, three. Kevin Hayes has two goals in his last 10 games and only has one point in his last five. He had a great start to the year, but he, hear me out, he has 10 goals so far throughout the entire season, and he's only scored four of those 10 since March 1. So you can definitely see that over half of his goals came in the first half, and it's been just a nightmare for the Flyers ever since, you know, the halfway point of the season. They've just completely so, fallen apart. I mean, this has yeah. to be one of the biggest collapses in recent memory, I would say, for an NHL franchise, and certainly one that was doing that well because they were leading the East Division at one point. I feel like people are going to forget that. Yep. Yeah, and it's kind of funny because here's another thing people forget, and this is this is weird. Like, I, I keep talking to, to Mark, Rangers fan, obviously, and we're talking about can the Rangers pass Boston? Is it possible? Blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, personally – uh, what I really hope for is we get Penn's Isles because that's electric, and then we get Caps Ragers because that's just the best. Oh my god! Uh, that, no, that's the best. But anyways, oh, I'm, God, Philly's still right there in the mix, and I'm forgetting about that because they pl- they've just been playing so bad. I'm like, oh, Philly's not making the playoffs. They're still well within striking distance, and they could very well do it. They just need stop. to stop losing to Buffalo and they can, they actually have a chance to get in. <laughs> well, that's, that's, literally what, it. that's what hurts them so much. You can't afford to lose those games in the city, in the, in the situation right. they're at. Cause that means they've got to win against the other teams, which is harder. So. Yeah. It's just, I mean, I'm looking at the standings right now. You got the Bruins in fourth place with 48 points. You've got the Rangers in fifth place with 44 and the Flyers in sixth place with 44. The Bruins have two games in hand on both of those teams. So, yeah, it's it's tough. It, it's tough. We'll see. I don't really know what to think of the Bruins. They're a weird team. But, I think they'll get in. I do yeah, too. I just I can't see like Bergeron and Pasternak and all those guys like letting that team fall. The only way I think they miss is if Rask ends up suddenly being like out for the season and like Halak is like shaky about returning to like if they don't get the goaltending thing figured out like soon that could that could change my mind about them making it. But even if those guys are out for another week or two, I think they'll be fine. I just think it can't be too much longer than that. That's my first and fourth liner. Anyway, my first liner is a goalie. We're talking about goalies. Vitek Vanacek, VV. Um, I'm big on this guy. I think he's looked a lot better than Samsonov the last week or so, two weeks even. Um, Vitek Vanacek is 8-3-0 in his last 11 starts. He's 17-7-3 overall. He's got a shutout. Um, he has taken, I don't know the exact stat on this one, but I swear to God, this guy has taken at least five different games that I can think of uh, into the third period with a shutout and ended up losing his shutout in the third period, like at least five different times. And it's usually um, just giving up a goal, like just exactly. One. Yeah, usually. 
Uh, he's been a stud. He's got an overall 913. That's pretty damn good for your rookie year, especially when you were, you know, didn't expect to be the starting goalie this year at all. And you've had to shoulder a lot of the weight so far. So um, yeah, I think he just deserves to be highlighted for that. Uh, fourth liner. We talked about him a couple times. I didn't even know if he got traded or not. Uh, Jamie Alexiak. Guys, he only has one goal and zero assists in his last 12 games. And that goal came last night. So that means he was 11 games pointless. I mean, I know he's not like supposed to be like a big goal scorer or anything, but like this guy, he's supposed to have some offensive upside. I think he he gets power play minutes. You got to think he's going to find an assist or two somewhere in those 11 games. Like it's just a little concerning that he was held. Even playing on the stars, you would think he would pick up an assist somewhere. Right. They, they, they score a lot of goals for the most part. And so I don't know that, that shocked me. So I felt, he was worth noting as a fourth liner this week. I want to ask you something about your first liner. If you're Peter Laviolette and we're, let's say the playoffs start tomorrow. Yeah. Fuck. Who starts in net? Honestly, it depends who we play because I feel like each of them have had the number of certain opponents this season. Um, but, but if it's like, you don't get to know who we play and I just have to pick a starter. I think I might go with VTech. I think he's just looked a little more dialed in throughout the season. Sammy has looked a little more like kind of going through the motions at times. Now, I mean, he's Sammy's had some really good games too. He's got a shutout this year too, but I don't know. It's just a toss up with Sammy and net every night. VTech, I feel like he, at least you can count on him to like try his best. Yes. Would you say this is like similar to 2018 where Gruby started the first game and then you might go to Holtby if you feel like, you know, could be the only difference is I mean I don't feel super confident in either of them at least we True. knew like Holpe should be a good like starting goalie and I don't know I actually felt really good with Grubauer initially too but I, I think it's more like when we had was it Neuvert and uh, Varley or yep. Neuvert even Neuvert and Holpe at one point I think and it wasn't really clear who was gonna be like the guy and I think they ended up splitting a lot of time that but. was up in the air for like four years because everyone was stealing everyone's job <laughs> yeah yeah well, um, we'll see. Yeah, let's get into the market report. Uh, my trending up team is going to be the Leafs uh, all aboard the soup train because soup's on right now. Uh, down team is going to be the Cats. The Florida Panthers have dropped their last three in a row, which the Cats have been playing well and they've made a splash at the deadline. I think they made a lot of good acquisitions, but you are not at a point in the season where you can be dropping three games in a row, especially in that division right now. Uh, for my up team, I don't do this often. I don't think I've actually done it once so far this year, but I'm going to choose the Pittsburgh Penguins, uh, my team. They've been playing really well. Uh, they're eight and two in their last 10. Kind of a weird week uh, as far as this past week since we recorded. Got sh- the shit kicked out of them by the Rangers, and then they beat the Rangers, and then they beat the Devils twice. I guess the good thing that I'm trying to say here is that we're beating the teams that we should beat. And we have pretty much the easiest schedule remaining um, in the NHL, I would say. Then we have our next six games go like this. Flyers, Buffalo, Buffalo, Jersey, Jersey, Jersey. So makes sense. I would hope that that's, I would hope about right. I would hope that's a six and oh run. We'll see. I, 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 my expectation is realistically probably like four. And I don't two. know. The Devils, I feel like play you guys well sometimes. They do play us well. And it's kind of weird, but we're expected to get Malkin and Kapanen back here shortly. So that'll definitely help uh, the offensive part of things. So we'll see, but they've been playing really well. Jari into Smith. I'm confident with them going into the playoffs. Nick, I'm going to take your question and apply it to me. If I had to start one, I'd pick Jari, but I would have no hesitation pulling him if things get, you know, short tight. leash kind of mentality. Yeah. Right. Smith's been playing pretty well. I, I, I give him props. I think I said in our se- season preview that, Nobody really knows who DeSmith is because he Jari came on the scene last year, but the year before that, DeSmith came onto the scenes and nobody remembers that part. So um, it'll be interesting. And then my down team, I alluded to earlier about how much money I've wasted on them. Um, the Minnesota Wild, they're five, three, and two in their last 10, and they're playing 500 hockey right now. And they're coming off two really, really bad losses to the Blues. One, they got just shit pumped and the second one they had their hearts broken and i don't really know which one's worse so fair enough going off of that um my up team is the blues and honestly i think they may have been my down team last week or the week before or something so that's kind of an interesting turn of events but 
Um, yeah, they got a big win against Vegas and then they won two against Minnesota, basically winning games that nobody expected to expected them to. I honestly thought they were dead in the water, but they're showing a little bit of fight. So I guess we'll see if they're able to, uh, keep that trend going or not. Um, down Chicago, I think, uh, for a while, they were really surprising people looking like they might be able to hold on to that fourth playoff spot. That race has gotten a lot closer in the last week or two. Um, they've dropped some games and started to look a little shakier. So uh, I think they had a good trade deadline. It did look like more of a rebuild type trade deadline, but I wouldn't say it was like full Buffalo Sabres mode or anything. So I'm interested to see what's going to happen with the Blackhawks for the next week or two. All righty. Uh, well, that wraps up the gambling aspect of this episode. Mac, I think you and I should talk a little bit about the craziness that has been our fantasy hockey league over basically the last three weeks. Cause it has just been a gong show dash to the playoffs. Yeah. Um, I somehow got in, I don't know how, even after losing this week. And I know you and I were texting last night. We had no idea what the tiebreaker scenario was going to look right. like because it, I mean, it's just been insane. Mm-hmm. So top two, there's two divisions, top two teams from each division go. Um, There was a clear cut winner in each division, but there was a tie for second place in both divisions. One division had a two way tie for second place uh, and the other division had a three way tie for second place. That was our division, Nick. It was me, Nick and friend of the pod, Stephen Baker, all tied for that second playoff spot. Um, What's interesting is that in the league info, it says that the tiebreaker is head to head matchup. Well, uh, Nick beat me head to head. I beat Steven Nick, uh, head to head and Steven beat Nick head to head. So that didn't really solve any problems with that. We were just back to square one. (laughs) Exactly. I think that they ended up giving it to you because you have more total points for it didn't say that, but I would assume that would be the next tiebreaker. I can't understand like what other stat or metric they would use to do it other than like literally just picking one of us out of a hat. So, however, what I'm salty about is the only game that I, or the only matchup I played against Nick this week was the one where you were on vacation and I still wasn't able to beat you. And I lost by like a point or a point and a half or something like that. It was, we had, it was like, it was I like think it was five less than a point or something yeah. like that. And that, that point is why I don't make the playoffs. And, and that do, was so. the one where it was like, I think I went away. I was in Florida with exactly. all my friends and it was like for two, the last two days, Saturday and Sunday, I just they, did not touch my phone. And I was making moves and trying <laughs> to gain points and I gained yeah. all but one of them. But yeah, yeah, anyway, congrats to you. And also congrats to my sister who made the playoffs on the other side of the, uh, uh, yeah. other division rather so I, I think the four finalists are my sister Cass uh Nick obviously and then um uh Matt Curtin yep and uh Sean Wertheim so those are the four uh four players competing for what is it uh do math real quick what's 20 times 12 240 yes 240 bucks so nice yeah good luck guys Yeah, thanks. Um, Definitely some formidable opponents in there. Curtin had his way with me down the stretch this past week. Your sister basically made me look like a preschooler halfway through the season. I think her team is legit. She beat me by like 50 points earlier this year. So um, (laughs) definitely. I told her if she wins the whole uh, championship, she can be a guest on the pod. So 100%. (laughs) Let's go. Yeah. I did get her back, so I'm I'm hoping that we do get like a deciding like tiebreaker right in here the, so. in the championship. That'd yeah. be interesting. That's yeah. all part of the plan. So stay tuned. A uh, couple questions before we wrap up. I just want to know what you guys think. Which deadline move do you think will have the biggest impact this season? Not you know, forget down the road, forget being re-signed, forget expansion draft. But this that does year, include playoffs too. That does include playoffs. Who do you think is going to help their team? do the best this season, including playoffs. Zajac. I, I, I think he's a diamond in the rough. I think he fits that team perfectly. I could see him scoring a really big goal in like a game six, like three minutes left. I'm not going to name a team who I think it'll be against. Um, one of those gigs. That's how I kind of see things. It probably will be the Penguins. So fuck me. If future, if future me's listening to this, then I really just hate myself. I'm going to go ahead and say Nick Foligno. I actually think that's going to be a really big one for the Leafs. I think that's another situation where, yeah, he was a great player in Columbus. He was the captain, obviously, but I think coming to 
the Leafs just full of talent on that squad. I think he's really going to find his, uh, his time there to be a lot of fun. And I think he's, you know, when you're having fun, you play good hockey usually. So. That's the one I was going to say. And just for sake of not repeating ourselves, I'm going to go ahead and say Devin Dubnik to the avalanche. I mean, you never know when someone's going to go into COVID protocol. So I feel like adding another goaltender that's got winning experience in the postseason is just such a huge ad for a team that very realistically could be hoisting the hardware in a, a few months here. For sure. Yeah, that's a good one. I think, uh, I, I don't know if this is a question or not, but I think the overall biggest winner of the deadline is the Islanders. 100% agree. It's either them or the Leafs. Yeah. Yeah. One of the two. One of the two. I would say, I, I love the Zay. Like, again, Paul Mary, great. I think Zajac is, um, he's going to be appreciated more so than people thought. And then and Coburn, Coburn on the back end. Yeah. That, that was yeah. the, the, deal sealer on that one for me once they got that him i was like all right. he he was on the cup winning team in tampa right yeah. yeah yeah so guy who's got it done once and has been around a long time so yeah good for them uh my last question is who are you most surprised that wasn't moved at the deadline well i think we were all thinking ekholm at one point was but then the predators started winning and they kind of said yeah we're not going to for me i the scott lawton uh, extension was very surprising. The Penguins were way high on getting Lawton. That was supposed to be our third line center, according to all the rumors. Uh, but I got to be honest, I am not mad at the Jeff Carter move at all. So um, who am I most surprised at not being moved? Probably Scott Lawton. I think I'd have to go with Alexiak. I mean, I literally thought he did get moved. So it's pretty surprising <laughs> to me. <laughs> so I know we just did this i think two or three weeks ago we made stanley cup predictions blah 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 but now that the trade deadline is over if you had to who's your cup winner right now someone anyone i'll go first. first i'll go first uh call this east bias call it whatever you want i think the new york islanders are gonna win the stanley cup this year holy shit oh my god Oh, I, can't I just look at what they did with a not as complete team last year. That team got a lot more complete this year. And Lee's coming back for the playoffs. Too. Lee's coming back for the playoffs. If Varley is competent and is just right where they need him to be, they don't need him to be spectacular. But if he continues to play the way that he has played successfully all year, I think a lot of teams are going to have a hard time with the Islanders. Someone say the caps while the sirens going. <laughs> <laughs> well you know what i was gonna say the islanders as well but since you said him i'll stick with my caps prediction i i really still think it's realistic i love the mantha move look every single year gmbm has made a big move something something big right we got oshi we got company that literally didn't look like a big move but that guy ended up being a huge proponent in us winning that cup that year uh, I was worried when he wasn't doing anything, but the Mantha move, I, I actually could see that being a piece that leads us to another cup. I really could. So I'll say it. Caps. Harry, you're sticking with the Leafs? <sighs> Dude, it's hard. I'm going to stick with the Leafs, but it's – well, actually, I know why this question came to mind. One, I said Carolina when we published all that last time. Yeah. And very strange, Carolina was super quiet which I kind of like, honestly. And once again, I'm just shocked they did not go. Like, Carolina could have gotten Dubnik. Right. No, they just – That's kind of who I was talking about before when I was like, I'm surprised a team that needed him more didn't go for him. But you know what? Uh, uh, what's it called? Carolina's the only team uh, in the league that has two goalies with, like, I think three shutouts apiece or something like it's that. It's true. So. Carolina is still very good. I think they're sneaky. It's hard to bet against the Leafs right now, but I don't know how long Campbell can keep this up. I think it will come back down to earth. But man, it's just it's hard to bet against Colorado, especially with that. And I'm statistic. surprised no one said them. Yeah, the March first stat that you yeah. read. That's I mean, if McKinnon's go, we need a McKinnon Matthews Cup final. That would be oh unbelievable. My God. That, that would, would be, be so cool. extremely exciting. I would love yeah. that. Um, if you had to make me pick one. I guess I'm going to go Leafs because I'm a boy. I'm all on the Campbell soup train. I love it. I'll the tell you what, if it's a avalanche Leafs final, I'm all in for Colorado. 
all in. I would be rooting so hard for them. You'd catch me at like every like sports bar. I'd probably order like a, a Colorado jersey just so I could like pretend to be a fan for a quick second. <laughs> like I'd be all in on them. If um, so, imagine that. So let's say it's Leafs abs. If you're, let's say, one of the guys at TSN, like what do you do? Because it's obviously not only is it abs Leafs, it's McKinnon versus Matthews do you root for the Canadian player or do you root for the Canadian team with the American player like I feel like that's gonna get some people funny yeah Yeah. it'd be it'd be great for the league to honestly hope that happens and like I mean let's talk about you know TSN for a second they spent probably 15 minutes of trade center today talking about how (laughs) a Canadian team hasn't won the cup since like 1993 or 1994 whenever the Habs did it last which by the way is 94 is when I was born. So it's been 26 years, but um, yeah, I don't know. Do you, I mean, do you think a Canadian team can win it this year? It's only, I mean, I, I don't think any, only it has the to be the, it's, it, it has it's to be the only Leafs. the Leafs. People today yeah. were talking, well, I think the Oilers could make, oh, no, up. no, no, just shut up. No, I don't think the Jets have it in them either. No, I'm at, uh-huh. I'm they gonna needed sh- to do something more at this deadline if they wanted to, and they didn't. I'm, I'm sorry, at- but Jordy Ben's not going to be enough. <laughs> I'm in a good mood. I'm in a shit stern mood. So I'm just going to ask this. If the Pens and Caps played a series right now, who you got? Caps, caps. and seven. You both said Caps and seven? Uh, Actually, maybe not. Caps and six. If it goes to seven, I would say Pittsburgh. I'd say huh. Caps and caps and six. Okay. I'll keep receipts. We, only because we would uh, just be too physical for y'all to handle. Mm, okay. Gotcha. Who would you I'm say? Not pre- I'm just what you but asked the I question. Also I want to hear your over answer in every single one of those. Games. Oh my god! <laughs> one at one at a time. What I want to hear your would... answer. One at a time. <laughs> I can't hear you guys. Back. Go ahead. <laughs> I just said I would have bet the over in every single one of those games in the series, though, if we did play each other. Oh yeah, absolutely. What were you saying, Nick? I want to hear your answer. Who would win? Pens and six. Okay. I got a good feeling about this team. I'm feel, like, I, yeah, I like of what's at. his name. This scrub who's got four goals and you're freaking out about it. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Like two, that my, goals, two goals, four it's points. Okay. No, I just feel the good. Horna. <laughs> yeah. I feel good about our team. I like where bonk. we're at. <laughs> yeah. yeah bonk. <laughs> All right. That's enough. People want us to All shut right. up. We, right, it's yeah. 8 52 PM. Yeah. We've been at this for a minute. Yeah. Jesus. All right. Well, all right, everybody. If you stayed around for the shenanigans, yeah, you know, sorry, not sorry. It's just part of what you get here. Um, go buy merch. Go buy yeah, go, merch, please. Go buy merch. Sick. Yeah, and if you have any ideas for merch, shoot that over to us too. Any playoff themes you guys are thinking about, we can we can do a lot with all that. So uh, we appreciate the love and support as always. And without further ado, class dismissed. <laughs>